Good evening, uh, good evening, everyone. If you can please take your seat, we'd like to uh, call our meeting to order. We do, uh, before we start our uh, regular board meeting, we have uh, our newest member, uh, member uh, Councillor Alan Hubley, who's going to be sworn in by the city solicitor and uh, clerk. So, uh, uh, Mr. O'Connor, where would you like uh, to join you at the podium? If you could join me over here, that would be great, Mr. Chair. Councillor Hubie, just take the Bible in your right hand, please. And if you would repeat after me, I, Alan Hubley, solemnly swear. I, Alan Hubley, solemnly swear. That I will be loyal to Her Majesty the Queen and to Canada. That I will be loyal to Her Majesty the Queen and to Canada. That I will uphold the Constitution of Canada. That I will uphold the Constitution of Canada. And that I will, to the best of my ability, and that I will, to the best of my ability, discharge my duties as a member of the City of Ottawa Police Services Board. Discharge my duties as a member of the City of Ottawa Police Services Board. Faithfully, impartially, and according to the Police Services Act. Faithfully, impartially, and according to the Police Services Act. Any other act and any other regulation, rule, or bylaw. Any other act, any other regulation, and uh, any rule or bylaw. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. And if I could just have you sign. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Chair, your newest member, Member Alan Hubley of the Police Services Board. Congratulations uh, to our colleague, Councillor Hubley, and welcome aboard, sir. Looking forward to working with you. Uh, we're going to go through our uh, consent agenda first. We have uh, quite a bit on our agenda tonight, folks, so I uh, need your uh, little bit of patience with this. Confirmation of agenda. Is okay, thank you. Uh, Confirmation of minute of uh, October 24th and November 7, 2016, that the Ottawa Police Service Board confirmed the minute of the 24th October and the 7 November 2016 meeting. Is the item carried? Thank you. Declaration of interest. Uh, so item uh, number one is the Chief's verbal report. We'll hold item number one. Item number two is 2017 draft operating and capital budget public dedication and uh, approval. And I have a number of my council colleagues here tonight. I'd like to recognize them in no specific order. Councillor uh, Riley Brockington, uh, Keith Egli, uh, Councillor Dan Dean, uh, Councillor Jeff Leeper, and Councillor Kadri. And I hope I didn't miss anyone. And uh, welcome, folks, to our budget meeting. Also, uh, item, we'll hold item number two because we have public delegation. And uh, item number three, human right and racial profile and policy annual report. That's chief report. So we'll hold item number three. Item number four, OPS gender e equality audit. The Ottawa Police Service Board received this report for information. We do have a presentation, so we'll hold item number four as well. Item number five. 2017 Police Service Board meeting schedule, and we have the list uh, provided by the Executive Director. Is the item uh, okay? okay? Okay, thank you. Item number six, out outstanding board inquiries and motion for November 2016. Is the item received? 
Item number seven, we have letters of commendation that the Ottawa Police Service Board received this report for information. Received, thank you. So we'll go to uh, item number one, which is the, the Chief's uh, verbal report. Chief. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair, and uh, our congratulations as well, Councillor Huey. Welcome to uh, the Ottawa Police Service Board, and we're looking forward to our uh, working with you. We worked with you along as, your, as a counselor's office and uh, no question, no doubt that we'll have a, a very pod, positive uh, working relationship. And I just want to introduce uh, Act, Acting Deputy Chief uh, Joel McKenna who's at the table with us. Uh, Deputy Chief Skitter is away on the course. So I want to begin by highlighting uh, some excellent work by patrol officers and our robbery investigators. At about 8 p.m. on November 3rd, a series of three swarmings occurred in the Hatteridge and Herringate area, uh, neighborhoods. Four or five suspects were confronting people and taking property. Frontline police officers flooded the area and arrested four suspects. The robbery unit was already investigating three recent robberies from the same area and were able to connect some of the suspects to other robberies both in that area and also in the Bayswater area. Also in October, the robbery unit had laid 27 criminal charges against one suspect in relation to four gunpoint robberies. That unit, led by Staff Sergeant Mike Harbosh, has seen a 13% increase in swarming solvency rates compared to this time last year. These are just a few examples of the great work that we're seeing on robberies. With respect to our uh, K-9 unit, through October and November, the K-9 unit has successfully tracked a number of suspects who fled from crime scenes. In fact, three armed suspects, a violent person wanted for partner-related offenses, a robbery suspects, a 38 caliber handgun, and a loaded 357 Magnum were all tracked by the skilled work of Constable DeZormo and his canine Frigo. Constable Richard and his partner Spartak, Constable Rochette along canine Nika, and Constable Moses with police dog Copper. Just an update on the marijuana dispensaries. We continue to monitor and investigate marijuana dispensaries. On November 3rd and 4th, the drug unit executed warrants at seven different Ottawa dispensaries, leading to a multiple, uh, multiple seizures and charges. As we expected, some of those dispensaries have since reopened. Our investigators are aware of these developments. And these investigations focus on drug trafficking, but they're also conducted in, in a landscape where viewpoints and laws on marijuana are changing rapidly. Each of these warrants require a great deal of investigative time and resources. However, we will continue to investigate dispensaries as complaints, complaints come forward and with, work with landlords to keep them from actually opening. I'd like to extend my congratulations to the police officers and members of the public who received or were nominated for awards at this year's Community Safety Awards held on November 7th. The event is organized by Crown Prevention Ottawa. The awards recognize the people, groups, and programs that have made a difference in preventing crime and making communities safer across the city. This event also includes the launch of Crime Prevention Week from November 7th to 12th. This year's theme, Personal Fraud and Scams, brought members of the public out to learn about fraud prevention. Thank you for our, to our members, volunteers, and partners who organized presentations, information tables, and more issues more across the city. Last Thursday, we held a community session to review the findings of the Traffic Stop Raise Data Collection Project with about 120 people in attendance. Uh, the York Research Team was present to answer questions on the report, and the meeting gave members of the community a chance to provide comments and feedback on what they read. Community police engagement will continue to play a critical role in this project to ensure that we understand the report, review the recommendations, and create a multi-year plan that goes beyond just action planning the report's recommendations. I'm pleased to announce that this next phase uh, of the project will be led by Acting Superintendent Chris Rayom. We took this project on because there are questions and concerns amongst some of our, of our community about bias and racial profiling that we can't ignore. I think it's leading to an important discussion on how we police our city and how we can ensure that our policing model is sensitive to the perception of the people that we serve. An update on the uh, regulated interactions and uh, the new provincial regulations provides uh, for voluntary police interactions. They are designed to ensure that the regulated interactions are without bias or discrimination. The new rules focus on data collection, retention, access, ma access and management, training and policy and procedures with audit and public reporting requirements. 
After January 1st, all sworn members who conduct regulated interactions, or formerly known as street checks, must have completed the eight hours of training. The requirements of training present significant unplanned pressures on the organization, particularly on training, particularly in training, data management processes, and storage, and auditing and reporting. However, we are working closely with the Provincial Working Group and our members to ensure compliance with the new regulations by January 1, 2017. And a report will be updated to the Board uh, in <coughs> December for your information. I'd like to send a big congratulations on behalf of the Auto Police Service to the Red Blacks on winning the Grey Cup. Our Emergency Operations Director has been working with the City to ensure plans are in place for a parade running from the Loblaws parking lot on Isabella Street along Pretoria and South on Bank to Exhibition Way at Lansdowne Park. It's a great game and a fantastic season. And in closing, I want to advise the Board that Deputy Chief Ed Keeley will be taking leave starting December 3rd until his retirement date, January 31st. I want to congratulate Ed on his 31 years of career in, career in policing and thank him for the many contributions he's made to the Auto Police Service and his community. His work ethic, his commitment to members, and his belief in service are, are important reminders to all of us that despite the changes that we're facing in policing, those core principles of what we do always remain serving and protecting with honor, courage, and service. So, Ed, thank you so much for all your contributions. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Mr. Chair, that uh, is my report. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Chief, and uh, congratulations to our deputy uh, on a 31 years, I believe, service uh, to our community. So uh, if you want to say something before we turn. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and actually to all the board, uh, I extend my deepest gratitude. Uh, appreciate the opportunity and the confidence bestowed upon me. It's been a tremendous honor and a privilege. And I'd also like to take uh, an opportunity at this time to thank those who do this difficult job every day. And that's our members who I hold in the highest regard, both personally and professionally. Thank you and thank the members for allowing me the privilege and the honor of working for you. Thank you for all of the work you do every day, for your absolute professionalism and all that you do and keeping all of us safe. I am forever in their debt and I appreciate uh, the honor that I've had over these 31 years. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Careful with those. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Chief, for the verbal report. And to my colleague, any question to uh, our Chief on the verbal report? See none on the verbal report. Receive. See, see. see thank you very much. Uh, we move now to item number two, which is draft uh, operating capital budget. And we do have a public delegation. Uh, we did see that presentation more than once in the public domain, and we saw it here. I'm not sure if we still need any presentation. I don't believe we do. Maybe we can just go directly to, uh, to the delegation. And we have a number who sign up to, uh, to speak. Uh, since we have this meeting in the committee, Finance Audit Committee, in, in uh, in two different times, and we invited our colleague, counselor, and the public to the open committee meeting, a finance audit committee, and we have quite a bit of counselor who attend those uh, meetings and had the chance to have a dialogue with uh, our staff. Today, we've given each member, public member or council member, five minutes to speak, and they can ask their question, and hopefully staff will be able to provide the answer. If it's not, 
I would advise those counselors can uh, make arrangement with the chief's office and have the finance staff have a meeting with those individual counselors who wish to engage uh, further or in more detail. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it first to Councillor Riley Brockington, and we're going through the list as they came to us. It's going to be some council member and some community member, but we'll start with Councillor Riley Brockington. And Councillor, thank you very much for coming out tonight and uh, joining us. You have five minutes. Thank you uh, very much. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Chief Bordalo, and members of the Police Services Board. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to share with you specific concerns that I have and the residents I represent have with the resources allocated to the Police Services Board and how those resources are then delivered to address various matters. I have five key themes which I will address in my five minutes. In the 2017 budget brief, the OPS reinforces that traffic enforcement continues to be one of its top three priorities. I strongly support this. However, I believe that inadequate level of resources are being made available to address this chronic and persistent problem across our city. Councillors and community members will agree that speeding and road safety for motorists, cyclists and pedestrians is an ongoing safety issue. And I will go so far to say that the risk to the public from speeding, aggressive and or reckless drivers is a major public safety and health issue. Every day in every community, motorists speed through residential communities, placing the lives of many local residents in jeopardy. Resources from the OPS are inadequate to fight this problem. For a number of years now, traffic units across Ottawa have been reduced to direct those human resources to other pressing needs. Traffic units, in my opinion, need to be left alone to focus on their main priority, to improve overall traffic safety and to enforce the laws within our city. And I'm concerned and not convinced that adequate resources are directed for this purpose. The second theme is about Ottawa 2017. The estimated cost to the OPS to serve and support various Ottawa 2017 events, in my opinion, is a risk. And it's a risk because the 1.5 million is a best guess and there are no guarantees that these costs can be totally recovered. The most recent list of plan events identified 1,200 events in Ottawa with only 10 being identified by the OPS as major. I'm concerned that the 1.5 million being identified as too low and that more costs may not be able to be recovered. Third, I applaud efforts by the OPS to continue to make efficiencies in 2017 with 2 million being identified as an objective. From what I heard at the most recent Finance and Audit Committee meeting that I attended, only a million has been identified. This poses another risk to the service as a two million efficiency target has been set to help balance the books while the roadmap to get there has still not completely identified how. Fourth, as no surprise to anyone, 2016 has seen a record number of shootings and a high level of homicides. If the trend for shootings is expected to continue to rise, as seen in other Canadian municipalities, are the units that proactively and reactively responding to these events receiving adequate resources to address their increasing workload? And finally, my last point, the neighborhood of Carlington, the largest community in River Ward has been home to too many high profile tragic events this year. This has caused residents and business owners to be concerned for their safety, property, and community as a whole. Overall, Carlington is a safe community. However, if someone does not feel safe, no words from me, you, or the mayor can change how they feel. Given that guns and gangs remains one of the top three priorities of the force, how will the OPS continue to work with me and the people of Carlington both reactively when incidents occur and proactively to get ahead of some of the issues and continue to underscore the great work that is going on every day? And supplemental to that, with all the talk of reducing the number of community police officers, how will this much needed and much respected resource be allocated in Carlington specifically going forward? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor. So we're going to start with the 
with the, the Director General to answer your question about the budget, and then we'll turn it to the Chief at some point when we talk about operations. So uh, uh, we'll attempt to answer all your questions. I hope we can. And if it's not, Councillor, if you have more questions, either send them to uh, myself or uh, uh, can arrange a meeting with the Chief and his staff. But I'll turn it to the Director General. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think the questions that um, that relate most to the budget are the 2017, the, the envelope we provided for the 2017 events and the efficiencies list. So I'll tackle those and uh, direct the, the other three to the chief. Um, there, there is no question, and we've said this throughout our budget briefings, that 2017 is a challenging year to try and um, get our, to maintain a handle on. Uh, from the expense side, what we're doing is uh, use the information we know to budget the expense side of the events and so far that's 10 to 12 uh, significant events that we're aware of um, they change they can change as as world events change uh, for example the uh, the visit of the new US president might add another event to the calendar there may be other um, high-level visitors who attend uh, our ceremonies in 2017 as we learn about those we'll update the board um, what we've been clear about though is that the resources of the Ottawa taxpayer aren't, can't be expected to cover those costs. They aren't legitimate costs to fall to the bottom line for the Ottawa taxpayer and we will do our best to recover them from third parties whether that's um, through a paid duty that might fall to a, a private uh, business as a result of the event, whether it's the federal government itself or the provincial government, we'll do our best to recover those costs so they fall to the appropriate level of government and we'll be feeding that information back to the board as the situation unfolds. Um, the, it is a very fluid situation. It's, it's, uh, we haven't encountered something like this before, um, uh, but the, our experience has been that, that where we can um, identify um, a high-level visitor, that we're able to um, as well uh, receive funding from the federal government from that through our, those, those channels, we'll do our best to recover that. Uh, but we have said from the beginning that that's the, the most difficult area of this budget to, to um, come to grips with. In our chats with the city treasurer on this subject, um, it's not something that is wise to budget for as a tax increase because it uh, results in a peak and that's not usually uh, good tax advice. So we'll keep everybody posted on that and do, uh, and do our best to ensure that there's minimal impact to the Ottawa taxpayer. Um, in terms of your second question, Councillor, about, uh, through the Chair, about the efficiencies budget, we do set a, a target of $2 million a year. It's a very aggressive target. We've hit it every year that we've set it. Right now, our list adds up to $591,000 and we're presenting a business case next week for um, uh, some back office transformation work that could take us well into the million range and we're also at the point where we think we can bring forward to the board um, the cost recovery uh, related to our online background check application so we from what we see now we're within um, reasonable striking distance of two million dollars uh, and our, it's been our experience that uh, we, uh, as the year goes on, that we can identify um, amounts equal to hit our target. So um, I can offer you our experience from the past and, and my confidence that we'll achieve it. Chief. Mr. Chair, uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor. So um, from a traffic safety perspective, absolutely, traffic safety is uh, still one of our top three operational priorities and will remain so in 2017. And we hear that from our uh, uh, councillors, we hear that from our officers, and we hear that from the public. Uh, so we will continue to focus on uh, those activities. And what we're trying to do as well with our uh, new frontline delivery is to be smarter and be more intelligent as far as where we need to focus those energies and those resources. Um, so we are, uh, we've centralized under the new model our traffic unit, uh, but I want to remind uh, everybody that uh, all our patrol officers, uh, it's their responsibility as well to do traffic enforcement. Um, as you may have seen, uh, we have seen a 6% increase in, 
in uh, traffic enforcement over uh, over last year, which is good news. And uh, I know that our officers will continue to do uh, to do a great job in enforcing traffic. And I think I also I want to compliment City Council on the work that they've done in uh, uh, leveraging. Um, uh, their uh, advocacy in bringing uh, about photo radar uh, back into our communities. I think that'll make a, a great investment and help keep our roads safer. Uh, safer. We, we do uh, advocate for the use of technology that's out there, and uh, whether it's uh, cameras on school buses, uh, red light uh, at intersections, or the use of uh, photo radar, uh, it's something that we support because we can't have our police officers everywhere. But we will continue to focus on where where we need those resources. Um, with respect to uh, the shootings, absolutely, uh, it's been a concern. We've seen a, over two years now a substantial increase in the number of shootings in our city, and uh, some of those, or half of them, are related to uh, our gang activity. And uh, we are adding 75 new officers over the next three years. Uh, 25 of those are just about to be uh, allocated. Uh, uh, to our sections uh, at the end of December in the new year. Um, so some of those officers will be going to uh, those units that do focus on uh, gun and gang investigations. Uh, we've restructured under the service initiative our uh, criminal investigations directorate to allow us to have more flexibility and fluidity in how we move our and allocate our detective resources. And uh, we've re recently also reprioritized as to who does what. So shootings uh, without injuries, our district, our, our level one investigators do those investigations. And shootings with injuries, uh, those are done by our guns and gangs units. Uh, so hopefully that, that will help us uh, manage those resources. But we will continue to, uh, to do a focus on, on solving. And you'll see in the recent news releases, uh, we've taken a number of guns off our streets. Uh, we're having an impact on arresting individuals and holding those people accountable. Uh, and you know, on your last point with respect to our work with uh, councillors and, and, and the communities, uh, you can have my reassurance that that work will continue, uh, councillor, uh, uh, both on the proactive but also on the reactive side. Uh, we've implemented a new control centre which will help us uh, better prioritise and understand where the resources are. And research has shown that if you only throw a couple of resources at solving a problem, it may take three, four weeks to resolve. But if you, you throw, if you double those resources, uh, it actually uh, it'll substantially um, uh, reduce the amount of time. So front-ending front uh, resources to solve problems uh, quicker, and then moving on to the next uh, areas is, is a new strategy that we'll be employing under a new service delivery model, and. Um, the, um, we will have a, an inspector that is overseeing our community relations unit that will be the key point of contact with our counselors so that we can manage those uh, and assess those uh, resources and those problems on a citywide basis. And uh, there are communities in our area that require more intensive work by the police service and uh, uh, that's the intent of this model is to invest them where we need them. Thank you, Chief. Any question from my colleague to... Uh to the councillor, councillor. Again, I open the invite to you. If you have more questions, you'd like to have time with our staff. By all means, before budget day on December 14, feel free to uh, arrange the meeting, and you, you can uh, help facilitate. You. I appreciate thank it, you. Mr. Chair, and thank you again uh, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brockington, for all your uh, interest in this town. Uh, our next uh, speaker, I don't believe, is here. Councillor Jody Medic. Jody is here. No, okay, well, maybe it's come back after. Uh, Councillor Keith Eglai. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record. I was in front of you a few weeks ago on, on the same issue, uh, but as far as my community is concerned, the issue isn't going, around, going away, rather. And, and that is the proposal going forward into 2017, which would see an actual decrease in the amount of community policing officers. By my estimation and what my community understands from attending the open houses, of which they, they did attend and participate, we're going to be seeing uh, a reduction of 33% in the amount of officers that are committed on a daily basis to doing community policing. Um, 
it's also my understanding, understanding my communities, that, that this reduction is going to occur even with the addition of 24, or 25 rather, uh, new officers this year and 25 new officers uh, the following year. So we're, we're adding more uh, police officers, but we're, we're taking away from, uh, from a vital, uh, I think a vital part of our, our, uh, our community approach to uh, policing. Um, to quote one of my community associations, and I provided letters the last time I was here, we are greatly concerned with this, with, the, with this initiative. We are moving from proactive, preventive crime initiative to the reactive approach. Um, and, you know, I, I, I heard, with all due respect, I heard what Chief Bordelow just said about certain areas of our city may require more resources than others, and he wants the fluidity uh, to do that. Um, but when you create a vacuum, when you remove a resource from a community, something's going to fill that vacuum. And the concern of, of the people in my community is that if we take away that personal face of the police in the neighborhoods, then, then things are going to happen, and the things that are going to happen are not going to be, are not going to be positive. Um, I understand it's a balancing act, and I'm, I'm not here so much to criticize, but rather to advocate uh, for what my community is saying to me, what they see as, as a defect in, in the process going forward. Um, they do appreciate, and again, last time we were, we were here, there was, there was a motion put forward to review uh, the new model as it goes forward, and that, that is appreciated. Um, but I guess my question overall is, if we're putting forward, or if the, the OPS is putting forward a budget that's going to create 25 new officers uh, over the next number of years, um, is there not a way to, to use those officers um, to, in effect, buffer the existing community policing uh, service uh, and, and you know, redirect resources so we still have those frontline uh, workers on a regular basis. Uh, I understand the model is to go to some sort of an inspector which will then deploy, but that means that one day you're going to get Eli out on a call for community policing, and next you're going to get Alan Hubley, and next you're going to get Wendy Fedick, and that breaks, as good as all those officers are, that breaks down that, that bridge of trust between the community and the policing officer, and it also creates a situation where you have a community policing officer that, that may know the whole zone, but not necessarily know that community, know that neighborhood, know intimately what those problems are and how to address them. So I guess my question is, is there not some way within the budget with the addition of the officers to somehow maintain the complement of community policing officers that we currently have, um, still allow you fluidity if that's what you need um, with the additional officers, but take some of them and, and, and leave them where they are or, or buffer where officers currently are to allow that community policing officer to still be in place and still work in a proactive and preventative way as opposed to simply rushing from one crisis to another to fix it Let's try and avoid those crises in, in the first place. Thank you, uh, Councillor Agra. We'll turn to the Chief. I think it's more on the operational side. Yeah, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. And, um, Councillor, I want to reassure you that you know, when we are out to do our consultation, we didn't learn anything new. We, we, we hear and appreciate and understand the importance of relationships, the point of contact, and that trust and the knowledge of the community. And uh, the goal of our new model, because the way we're doing business right now is we are actually running from crisis to crisis. We do some good problem solving, uh, but we're not doing it as... Uh, uh, as well as we can, we could be doing it. And uh, so the focus of our new model is to actually be more proactive than reactive and increase that reactive, uh, that proactive time to work with our community partners. And uh, I want to reassure you that that is, that is part of our goal, to become more intelligence-led, to use information, to be more effective and efficient in solving problems and putting those officers uh, where we actually need them. Uh, it is a change in, in, in culture, and I don't think we should be looking at just the reduction in community police center officers in isolation to the entire model. 
uh, although we are going from 16 to 10, uh, I think there's a, uh, there's, there's a redefining of a bunch of roles and responsibilities uh, for the entire front line uh, that they will become engaged in, in more proactive work. Uh, now, it's, it's a new model, and uh, we've committed to working. We've got a, a community advisory group that's, uh, that's providing us uh, some, some insight and input uh, to make sure we get this right, and we will continue to work with our community and readjust uh, where, where we need. Uh, Mr. Chair, do you have time for one quick follow-up question to the Chief based on what he said? Okay, we're going to allow this, but this, we said along, all along, you come to a committee meeting and ask as many questions as you like. Here, we like to receive presentation, and I like to be fair to community members as much as we offer to Council, but because the Chief has asked you the question, go ahead. So, so I'm not engaging in back and forth. No, no, I'm not. And it's just it flows the chair. from some, some something through the sets. chair. Through the chair. Yes. So, Mr. Chair, uh, the question is this: If if we're, we are reducing, and, and the admission has been made from 16 to 10, and, and there's also been the the admission earlier on to Councillor Brockington that we're going to go to more technology-based approach to to traffic enforcement, I'd like to know where those 25 officers are going to be deployed, what are their duties going to be going forward if they're not going to be in traffic enforcement and they're not going to be in community policing? Okay, I'll, I'll let the chief answer that, but I don't think we ever said as, as a board where they're going to go because as a board we are supporting the chief to, to have that employment, but it's up to the chief as a chief operation officer where to see the need for the new addition police officer to go, but we never said we don't want to do them in traffic. Or I don't think we ever assigned them from here. They're assigned by the chief, but I'll let the chief clarify this. Chief? Mr. Chair, uh, the first 25 officers are being allocated to three areas. One is to deal with our guns and gangs issues. The second issue is around violence against women. And the third issue is around uh, the accommodations and providing some relief around those areas. The next 25, which are coming on board in 2017, have yet to be assigned. Uh, that's an exercise that we're actually going through the specific uh, positions uh, in, in December, where that exercise is going to be taking place internally. And once we make uh, the decisions as to where those positions are going to, and we certainly will be reporting back to the board as to where uh, those new positions are being allocated through the budget process. Thank you, Councillor Egli. And Councillor Egli, again, if you feel the need to meet with our staff before the budget, by all means, we'll make sure we'll get you some time with our staff. Thank you, sir. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Norman Moyer, or Moyer, a Lower Town Community Association. Is Moyer or Moyer? Well, it depends how you say French or English. Good evening, sir, and uh, you have five minutes to address the board. Need to push the button, okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for a chance to speak to you on behalf of the Lower Town Community Association tonight. We are an active community that sees ourselves as a partner with the police forces and with the city in, um, in fighting crime, in preventing crime, and in responding to crime in our neighborhood. We need more help to play our role effectively as a partner. Um, the kind of help that I'm talking about, in fact, I mentioned before at an earlier presentation that I made uh, before this board, for communities to fill their role as partners, they need a better understanding of what's happening. What is the crime level in their community? Is it going up? Is it going down? Where and how is this happening? So my question to the police is, will this new budget include the opportunity to improve the information flowing uh, to communities? Let me take just a moment to outline how difficult it has been for Lower Town to come to a real understanding of what its crime levels are. We get lots of help from the media. They constantly report on crimes in Lower Town. Some of them actually occur in Lower Town. Um, others are just close by, but we get them labeled on us regardless of that. Um, when we try to counter that, when we try to really understand it, we find no consistent basis of reporting. We couldn't get a standard report, so we went through the Freedom of Information Act. For four years now, we've been getting data from the Ottawa Police Service. We thought we were making progress on that. 
although we would have preferred a more proactive process, until last summer when we got a fifth report, which changed entirely all the numbers that we had seen in the previous four reports for the earlier years. It's very difficult for us to develop an understanding of what's happening in our community unless there's a clear basis of knowledge to work from. I think the police need a stronger research and uh, analysis capability. I think we need better statistics. And we need an open data site where communities can see that information quickly. We understand that there's work underway with the Ottawa Neighborhood Study to make more crime data available. We support that. We'd like to see it move quickly. Um, we hope that the police force will have more ability to analyze, to be proactive. This is a plea certainly for proactive police activity and doing good intelligence, good analysis. And of course our community continues to support the need for community policing officers in an area which no matter what basis of reporting you take, remains one of the highest crime areas uh, in the city of Ottawa. So will there be more? resources directed to giving communities a good knowledge base of what the crimes are in their area. Thank you very much, uh, sir. And I will turn it to the chief to respond to your question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll start off, then turn it over to uh, Cam Hopgood, one of our uh, individuals involved in uh, this area. Uh, but I can assure you, I, I can't disagree with anything you said. Uh, we want to have a police service that, um, that provides the necessary data for our community uh, to better understand what's happening in their neighborhood from a crime and disorder perspective. Uh, we have been limited by the technologies that we currently have within the police service and uh, we have, the board has just approved the launching of a $42 million investment in our IMIT roadmap which will uh, uh, provide the, the needed infrastructure changes to our data and to our systems that will uh, enable us as a police service to uh, analyze and understand data, uh, crime data that is taking place to be, uh, allow us to be uh, more predictive in crime trends and also uh, provide uh, the information that the community needs to, to better understand what's happening in their communities. As to the specifics, Cam? Uh, just to add to that, <clears throat> and as you mentioned, we have been working with the uh, Ottawa Neighborhood Study and we do anticipate releasing five years of crime data at a neighborhood level uh, early in 2017 and uh, building that into our model in terms of releasing data moving forward uh, in with our annual report each year. So that cr criminal code offense data will be available to the community as well as calls for service related data. I think uh, as the Chief just mentioned in terms of the IMIT strategy as we move forward, enabling an evidence-based decision-making capability both internally and externally externally is a priority for the service, so it's something we're actively working on. Mr. Chair, I'll also add, sometimes, sometimes we're limited as to how we're mandated to collect data for uh, Statistics Canada, and sometimes we're limited to how they report and we feed off their information, but we certainly want to be as creative as possible to provide the information that uh, our community needs. Okay, any question from my colleague, Member Smallwood, to the delegate? Yes, well actually it's as a result of the delegate's comment, I just, uh, uh, I guess probably directed to the chief, is just he mentioned that the community, the community had to do a freedom of information request to get, and I'm just wondering, um, will that be, has that been solved so they don't have to do it, or if they do have to do it, why, 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 do, why are we forcing them to go through that process? Thank you. Um, the reason why they had to do a freedom of information request was because it was a custom geography. We capture geographies as uh, divisions, districts, zones, and atoms, but they don't naturally conform to a particular neighborhood. So that's why, uh, unfortunately, it was an additional manual effort of something we don't naturally capture and would have to be aggregated to a particular area. Moving forward with the Ottawa Neighborhood Study Boundaries and our new uh, deployment model, those geographies will already be integrated into our computer-aided dispatch system as well as our records management system. So it will improve the ability to provide that information to the community on a more regular basis. Thank you, uh, Member Smallwood. Thank you very much, Mr. Moore. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, we have uh, Councillor uh, Diane Dean.
Good evening, Councillor, and thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you very much for the opportunity to present here today. I, I have to say I've attended two of the, um, the budget-related meetings of the yes, Place Board, and uh, I've had my questions asked and answered. So today I'm really here to uh, just reflect on what's in this budget and what I think you need to think about uh, before you vote on this budget. And I, I just did want to take the opportunity to wish uh, Deputy Chief Keeley all the best as he leaves the Ottawa Police Service. Wherever the road takes you ahead, Chief, I hope it's a, it's a good road and we really appreciate uh, the work that you have done. Thank you very much. I actually appreciate that very much. It's pretty kind of you. So, um, as I said, uh, I just wanted to reflect on some of what I heard. Um, and I'll tell you in an overall sense, I'm just worried that this budget that is being presented to you is frankly in some areas just not achievable. I think we talked about that at the audit committee. And in other areas, maybe missing the mark on um, the community's priorities. Uh, I can tell you that we're all concerned about the proliferation of gun and knife violence that we have witnessed this year. I had the opportunity to ask the chief about that at the Audit and Finance Committee meeting. My question was, is this a blip or is it a trend? And what we heard from the chief is, in all probability, it's a trend more than a blip. It's something that's happening across North America, that the escalation of violence, the rush to use a gun or a knife is is happening much quicker than it has in the past and so we can probably expect much to all of our collective chagrin that this is something that will continue so for me when i hear that it tells me that we need a a, a renewed gang related strategy to really address this escalation and i i don't see the the funds in the budget to 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 address that. Um, as well, you've heard some, from some of my other colleagues, um, uh, I think all of my council colleagues and probably most residents will tell you that um, the, it, there are serious issues in our city with tra traffic enforcement, and yet I'm not convinced that the necessary resources are in this budget really to address that problem. Um, Actually, there seems to be a lack of resources available to meet police demands in a number of line items in this budget. Let me just highlight a couple of those for you. Currently, this budget is recommending an $800,000 reduction in overtime hours from the 2016 forecast and a reduction of $2.5 million in overtime from the 2015 actual uh, number. Uh, that does not appear to be a realistic or achievable number in my estimation. Also, you have a million and a half dollar unfunded, million and a half unfunded pressure as a result of the 2017 special events. Um, you, you are hiring 25 new officers this year by shifting internal resources, but even at that, Ottawa's per capita police spending remains very low when benchmarked against other municipalities. Um, I, for one, still believe in an ounce of prevention, and uh, your SI will result in the loss of five community police officers who provide, in my estimation, immeasurable value in the prevention efforts. I think I've spoken to the board on this topic before. I think you know how much I disagree with the reduction of community policing and, uh, and the approach, which will be only in high risk neighborhoods, which to the best of my knowledge, you still have not defined what a high-risk neighborhood is, but uh, that can certainly be something that transitions as you move those uh, reduced number of community police officers around. So I just don't agree with that approach. Um, let me just say, though, I do have the utmost respect for the work that the Ottawa Police Services does and for the efforts that you make to ensure the safety of our city. But I feel this budget document is filled with risk, and I really question if all of you on the Police Services Board are really satisfied that this budget is, one, achievable, and two, in the community's best interest. And I would just ask you to reflect on that before you vote on this budget today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Dean. Chief, do you wish to comment or work it? Uh, I wasn't sure if there was a question. Uh, the one there thing was no I, question, I, but I, the Councillor you know, Dean said this presentation before, and we do appreciate your uh, uh, message you. uh, all the time. So thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, uh, any question from my colleague to the Councillor? No? Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Dean. Councillor uh, Leeper. Uh, 
Good evening, Councillor. Good evening. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, members, for an opportunity to address uh, a topic that uh, I believe you'll hear from any number of uh, my councillor colleagues, and that does go to uh, traffic enforcement. Uh, we're talking a lot of, about a lot of things in Kitchissippi Ward right now, uh, but right near the top of the list is, is traffic considerations and the implications of traffic for cyclists, pedestrian, and driver safety. Uh, there are too many cars that are driving too fast on too narrow streets, streets that are being developed to accommodate intensification and more cars. Not only are the cars driving too quickly through our residential streets, uh, many times they're treating the rules of the road as suggestions, for example, when it comes to stop signs. One of my assistants waits for the school bus every morning on Tweedsmuir with his uh, kids and he started keeping track of how many people uh, obey the four-way stop that is at that intersection. On a good day, 75% of motorists don't stop and on a bad day, it's 100%. The problem is that this is just one of several intersections involving several streets across the whole ward where this happens. We have hundreds of children walking on these streets on their way to school across the ward every day. We're hearing from organizations like Walk Ottawa about a tangible decline in the OPS capacity to carry out enforcement in school zones. Provincial legislation is coming to help, but we can't wait and we shouldn't. Our office hears complaints from McKellar Park in the west to Hintonburg and Mechanicsville in the east. Listing all the areas would go well below, uh, beyond my allotted time, but Broadview, Dover Court, Kirkwood, Byron, Burnside, Clearview, Richmond, Scott, Holland, Bayswater, North are just some of the streets about which we get calls every single day. Residents are clearly frustrated. They're turning to my staff to provide temporary traffic calming measures to help. The thing is that these measures, like a flex stake in the middle of the road, might slow down vehicles for 100 meters or so where they are, but they don't force people to stop at a stop sign. What the residents of Kitchissippi are asking for is more resources poured into enforcement. They feel, as I do, that the best way to ensure that all road users follow the rules is to make sure that it hits people in the wallet when they don't. They don't understand how there aren't apparently enough resources to fund an enforcement program that would generate considerably more resources. Put a cruiser at any one of our residential intersections for a day. How many tickets could you assess in an hour? The officer would be busy. At the budget consultation I held with my colleagues here at City Hall, we heard about the need for enforcement that would direct the financial penalties back to funding more enforcement. No one is calling for a cruiser at every intersection, but surely we can do a better job ensuring that people follow the rules of the road. I know that the Ottawa Police Service does an excellent job with the resources that it has. I know it has several priorities as officers work to keep our streets as safe as possible. But I feel that traffic needs much more consideration. We need enforcement to keep our, roads see, uh, keep our streets safe for all users. We need it in Kitchissippi, and I would be very surprised if we don't hear that from every other cou councillor around the table who will tell you the same thing. Chief, you addressed the, uh, the enforcement question uh, earlier. I know that you're doing the best that you can. I don't know if we have enough resources being poured into it. And when you're considering passage of this budget, please keep that first and foremost in mind. Chair, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Lieber. Chief. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I won't repeat what I said with, uh, with the other council, but I think what I can reinforce is that the importance of the community reporting to us, and uh, we're trying to make that e as easy as possible as far as opening up our, our online reporting capabilities it's for the public to report uh, areas of concern where, uh, where we can be uh, smart in deploying the resources where we need them. It is a matter of prioritizing because it is, uh, it is a number one uh, complaint that we get across the city, and uh, we do have finite resources, and we try to deploy them where we need them. 
Uh, you're right, we can't put a, a cop in every corner. That's not realistic. But what we try to do is with the information we have, we try to put our officers where we need them to deal from an enforcement perspective. We also value the partnership we have with Safer Roads Ottawa in coming up with some education and engineering programs as well that will alleviate uh, the concerns that, that you speak about. And again, I really applaud the city for uh, for the work that they've done in reintroducing photo radar and using technology. Uh, I'd love to see it broader than school zones. Uh, maybe that'll come. I, I get the fact that it's, it's, um, it's a baby step, but it's an important step in reintroducing it in Ontario. Uh, but uh, leveraging technology uh, will cert would certainly help us and keep our roads safer. But thank you very much for your comments. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, before you go, before you go, Councillor Leopold. Councillor, we'll just be thankful that the hospital board and its wisdom won't approve the hospital in Honey's Pass. <laughs> Point heard loud and clear, Member Duro. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members of the board, for uh, giving us uh, some time to discuss the budget. I really appreciate it. I also participated and met with the chief recently, but before I go, uh, I go into uh, those discussions and, and certainly um, my thought about the budget, I also want to thank uh, Deputy Chief Ed Keeley for not only his professional work, but his uh, personal work in our community uh, with Christy Lake Kids, Boys and Girls Clubs, and, and so many others we've seen Ed for years in and around. I've had the opportunity to uh, work closely with Ed and, and his team for the past six years and uh, we, we have been very fortunate to have him. So I think it's important. Uh, thanks, Ed. Thank you very much, Councillor, again. Uh, I really appreciate those words and it's been a pleasure working with yourself as well and Councillor Deans for the time she took to say thank you. So and hopefully uh, we'll be able to continue to see you in our community uh, yeah, absolutely. in those capacities. For sure. Uh, so I was quite happy, Mr. Chair. I had a, a really good meeting uh, with the Chief recently and, and thank you, Chief, for, for the time. Um, it, there continues to be concern uh, that I have around uh, the budget when you look at some of the pressures, you look at the new officers, you look at the um, some of the um, some of the, um, the realignment of, of the, these new officers and what that means. I think what we need as council and, and as a board to take a bit of a step back and say we're living too many transition all at once. There's gang pressures, there, there's the SI going on, there's pressures around data, and, and you've heard from my community. You, I mean, there's so much pressure point that I think uh, the one thing that I wanted to, to hear today is not and to bring to the table wasn't to open another can of worms. But it was to say that when I met with uh, the chief, I was happy on the conversation we had. I was confident that my concern relating to uh, uh, the information shared to the community about community policing, uh, and more specifically for uh, elements that I've advocated for around the foot patrol and the expansion of it, might not be all resolved as part of the SI initiative, but certainly will give uh, the executive team at the Ottawa Police Service uh, an opportunity and some abilities to restructure. And if there's one thing that, that I know is that uh, our, our men and women who wear the uniform uh, do it proudly. They live and work in our city and, and certainly recognize uh, the challenges of the various communities. And, and that, uh, as a member of council and as members of the board, I'm sure we can all appreciate that. Um, the the one thing that I, I the one thing that I'd like to to bring up is certainly the the longer you bring the the SI transition forward, the more the more challenging it, it is, and and certainly the the chief and I have, have come across different situations in the community where there continues to be angst, concern, and so on about the SI. So if there's one thing that I could ask is to to bring forward to members of council in the community the landing point, not just the end of January position, but really, when are we going to have the model fully presented so that we can go move on with the next discussions, which are how do we continue to engage our communities, how do we expand pro programs like Foot Patrol, and how do we bring in new technologies uh, in terms of data. So uh, I'll leave it at that. It's, it's more of a, a, a summary of our discussion. I, I have uh, full confidence and certainly uh, recognize uh, the uh, the, the moving parts that the board needs to, uh, to consider this evening.
Well, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Fleury, and thank you for attending our budget in the past and asking your question. I'm not sure if the Chief wants to add uh, what you said, but uh, obviously what you said here today and, and you said in the past, it is a challenge, and we are working with those challenges. But, I mean, it's... Uh, I'm sure we, can, we hear, you know, uh, are you stressed for the budget? Well, sure, if you give us a lot more money, we'll do a lot more. But, I mean, there's a balance where we, we need to find that balance and that pressure point you're talking about also is coming from the taxpayer, how much they want to pay. So uh, it, is a, it is a chance for us, but I think our staff doing a great job. And the SI is going to be enrolled in January, but I think that's when you have the full picture. And I hope uh, we we'll bring something either to a committee setting or uh, an engagement setting where, where the councillor can see the changes they're seeing. I'm not sure, Chief, if you want to add any more at this point. Yes, please, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, and uh, appreciate me, you meeting with, with me in my office. There was a very productive discussion, and you're right. Policing uh, will always evolve. It's always evolved, and it will continue to evolve. So we're always looking to see how can we uh, better deliver the service and be responsive to our community. And I've heard it internally as well as far as, okay, when is SI rolling out? We've been working at it for a couple of years now, bu building the, the fundamental building blocks. Uh, you know, the CID restructuring took place in early October. Our control center was active at the end of October. January 23rd is the, is the largest part of that new restructuring of our frontline deployment model. Uh, so that will be the, the key date in our organization that we're finally moving to that new model that we, we have been talking about it and then continue to work with our community. So uh, uh, we're just at the, uh, the cusp of making those, uh, those uh, uh, fairly significant changes within the organization. And you're right, the, the men and women of this organization do a fantastic job job in very uh, difficult circumstances and it's always changing and it's always changing for them and that's uh, sometimes hard to keep up with. Merci beaucoup, Concier. Uh, folks, uh, this is the list we have for people who are just to speak on this item, the budget item. If there anybody from the public has any sign, wish to speak to us about this item? I see none. So I'm going to turn it to uh, our board member to start the question. I'm going to start with Councillor Hopefully our newest member get the first question tonight. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it, and I'm very honored to be here tonight. Um, a question I would have uh, uh, through the chair is on the um, community police officer issue that uh, uh, some of my colleagues raised, and I'm sure uh, you've heard uh, strong feedback from uh, the public on this as well. I'm just wondering uh, if we had... Um, built into this decision the ability to modify it or reverse it should significant challenges come out six months down the road and uh, we feel that we have to add back in a few CBOs or, or do something different with that program or are we uh, on a train going full speed ahead? Superintendent Ford's going to speak at this. Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, we, we definitely have built in a feed, feedback mechanism in regards to that. So currently, right now, prior to going live in the implementation on January 23rd, we have this service initiative community advisor group, which is a group of about 24 plus uh, representatives from the community. And even as we move towards implementation, we're gaining their input to ensure that when we do go live, we're as close to as perfect as we can be. But even after that, that group will remain in existence to provide a feedback mechanism to the organization to ensure that we can fine-tune anything. And on top of that, there will be an evaluation of the effectiveness of the overall frontline deployment model just to make sure that we're realizing the benefits and the outcomes that we had hoped for. When would that evaluation take place? Uh, that won't be until a latter part of 2017. In order to do a, a proper evaluation, you need to have it in place and to sort of stabilize. And then at that point in time, you'll be able to monitor the uh, or evaluate, I should say, at that point in time. And one last question on that. Uh, have we looked at a model at all where we could hire retired officers to work in a CPO-like uh, position? And if so, I want first bids on Deputy Chief uh, Keeley. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Member uh, Councillor Trini. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Feels like we've been dealing with this for quite a while, so I've asked the majority of the questions that I thought were pretty important. But there was one thing that I just wanted to kind of go over. On page 155, uh, there's a, a service cut, uh, cutting $50,000 for the community events from the budget. Now, with 
the situations that occurred on Jasmine, that money was very important because right after that took place, and forgive me if I'm misdirected and that money came from somewhere else, um, that community event was very critical right after the third incident in Jasmine because we got the whole community out. Uh, do you see any negative impacts coming out of removing that kind of funding? And like, are these events still going to be able to take place, or are we going to have to go through CPO or a different group to be able to make this happen? What page did you say, Councillor Tremley? Uh, I believe it was page 155. 150. It's the 50,000 for community events being reduced. Okay. Uh Raleigh, you see, or you see the number on page 155, I believe. Show it to her. Oh, she's going to show you. So we'll, we'll find out where the, the number is coming from, but, but uh, Mr. Chair, I, I want to reassure the community that, you know, if, sorry, I found it right here. So yeah, page 155, it's uh, line uh, 502. Uh, 928. It's about three quarters of the way down the page. So it says 50,000 2016 budget, zero 2017 budget. Yeah, so I'll, do, I'll just take this just really quickly. Um, so this is in our corporate accounts. You good? Okay. Um, this is uh, this line item uh, you, you've highlighted here is in our corporate accounts uh, section. Um, what we'll have to get back to you with is, uh, so this was, this was added in likely late in the budget process in 2016, so it was put in our corporate accounts section um, from a realignment, it was realigned in our 2017 budget. We'll have to get back to you with where that item uh, landed in our 2017 budget. So we can get back to you with Sorry, that. Sorry, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really clear on that, Mr. Chair. If I could ask for a little more clarity. The, my, my major concern is if we have a major incident, the ability to mobilize very quickly. The force was fabulous. We were out there within a week. We had dunk tanks. We had a whole bunch of series of events. We had all the police out there. And it was really good. The community felt very good about it. And I just want to make sure that is this line item directly tied to those kind of activities? I, I don't believe so. Uh, I don't, it's not related to that type of activity. Uh, well, we have major events in our community. We will continue to uh, to respond and be engaged in, in the, you know, the, the, that dialogue that takes place in the community based on our major events response protocol. Okay, maybe, maybe we can take this off, offline. Uh, there is still a little bit of time between now and council, but I, I think this is, this is critical. Just know what that, what that $50,000 was. It, it may seem insignificant, but it could have an impact. It's not insignificant, but I believe that 50000 went to the public relation because the public relation increased by 50000 and you take it from community event. Is that the same 50000 it seems equal number gone up by. Yeah. So what I, what I would prefer to do is, is uh, just confer with, with our staff, per, perhaps before the end of the, the session today, we can, we can get back to you with that. Um, okay. Great. And, and just a, a quick other question, uh, Mr. Chair, yes. if it's okay. And I, I appreciate that. I mean, this is a pretty massive document. I wouldn't expect you just to, but it's, uh, it is important to me. The other question is related to, obviously, back in uh, 2014, we received uh, $10 million from, from the Conservatives when they were up there. Have we been actively lobbying them, uh, looking for additional funding for ourselves? Uh, this one is not a... That the, the money you're talking about, Councillor, it become a line item budget in uh, uh, in uh, federal government. So mm -hmm. they're, they're always giving us that two million dollars annually. So uh, we kind of expect it, and it's part of the, it's part of our budget, uh, right, Director General? So so that we don't have to renegotiate it, and it's not just ten million; it's two million each year for. Yeah event we do Absolutely. working with. Absolutely. And the reason, Mr. Chair, I raise it is uh, FCM was in Ottawa last week, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, and national policing is always a discussion at any point. So with a new government, it uh, can't always hurt to go hat in hand again and say, new government, maybe you have a stronger view on policing. I just want to make sure we're making uh, those pitches. I, I don't want to rock the boat too much, Mr. Uh, Councillor Turney, because I don't want to lose that $2 million already in their budget. So if it's in their budget, in the budget, let's not uh, rock so we're, we're good. As long as stay there, I'm happy. I'm not sure other municipality be happy, mm -hmm. but ours is. So.
Uh, any other question, Member Turning? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, thank you. Okay. Uh, Madame Delicat. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Mine has to do with uh, page 62. It's uh, in the budget. It's called Ottawa Police Service Community Police Centre, CPCs, 2017 net budget by centre. So I noticed that the total net expenditures is of $1.9 million. So I'm just wondering, with all the changes that we're proposing in our new initiatives, how is this going to affect those CPC um, locations? Is that yes. money going to be reallocated elsewhere? Or? Yeah, no. yeah. Thank I'll you. let the Director General answer that question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, what we said at the, at the outset of the budget discussions was that we've kept the budget in the old format, the old police services model format, and one of the first things we'll do in the new year is re, uh, readjust it around the new model. So those... Um, those budgets that are shown on page 62 relate to our old CPC model. All of the um, all of the costs and all of the folks are readjusted in the new world. So we'll be able to show you as we do the the recasting of the budget where those dollars went, uh, so that you'll see before and after we balance and where the resources have gone to. So, so I can understand it, uh, Director General. A lot of changes have took place through the years. So now we become partners with the city. We are in location with fire services and other in some of the rural community. Now, the one is on the list are those, some of them from the past and some of them still exist. Am I correct? Yes, they do, Mr. Chair. And where we'll be working with SI is to understand the role of the new community police officers and the geographic bases. Uh, that they may that they'll be working from okay. and aligning this budget to show you what the new environment looks like Okay, that, that, I think that's uh, fair enough. Uh, Any other question member Smallwood? Thank you. Um, I, I guess my question um, uh, I'm not quite sure what the question is. Uh, it's a concern I have uh, I've, I've heard all the presentations I've gone over the budget and I heard the Director General's response to some of them and the concern I have and remains and, and if anything it's growing is that there are so many demands on our, our forces and uh, we're, we're looking at a situation where currently I think our wages represent over 80 percent of our budget. Um, we're seeing more and more demands on and we're hearing we want more, we want to hire more officers. The cost of these officers, is the cheapest day is the day they first start here, and it's going to continue to go up from there. Um, the Director General has mentioned that in the past we've been, essentially what we're doing is we're funding these new officers with the savings they've been able to find. But I think there's a, a phenomenon known in savings as low-hanging fruit. And what happens is, is that it gets harder and harder and harder to find those savings. So yes, in the past, I think we've, our staff has done an excellent job at finding those savings to afford these new officers. But I am very concerned going forward that we've got all the low-hanging fruit now and we're, 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 we're heading in a disastrous direction. We're, we've got an ever smaller amount to, to find the savings from. Our wages are growing because we're taking on more people and yet we're, we're expecting we're going to find the savings to pay for those out of something where we've already picked the low-hanging fruit. So I'm not sure if that's a question or what, but that's a We'll take that as a comment. I think we all can share with you the concern, but that's why our staff working very hard to find those efficiency, and, and we're always presenting a balanced budget. We all know we have to present a balanced budget, and we are doing so. Uh, even with the hiring, we still managed to uh, uh, now, maybe next year, we have to make a tougher decision than what you're making today on a lower fruit, but uh, I mean, I can't say more about our staff with the initiative we're doing, and, and I know we, we haven't laid out every detail because obviously we're taking step by step because the changes is, is hard and we have to make sure everything in place, but I mean, we make investment in technology and we're hoping that technology can help us to, to guide us and cause, uh, you know, find us some saving in other areas. So that's our hope for 
And I agree with you. I mean, we, we, we want more and more and, and with the, the same amount of money. So the money has not been changed much, but the demand, it seems, is growing. But we need to keep an eye on and we need to support our senior management team and work with them and to find that. But I mean, any time we don't bring in a budget here, balanced budget, then really that discussion should take place. But so far, we are doing this. I'm not sure, I know that's not a question, but, but is the belief, we, you know, we are moving forward and, and we are achieving. Last year we hired 25 and we still present a balanced budget. This year we're hiring 25 and we're still presenting a balanced budget. So any question or any comment from my colleague on the budget? Uh, are we uh, ready to... Uh, to vote on the budget. So uh, that the Ottawa Police Service Board, one, approved that 2017 draft operating and capital budget is item number one, K. Thank you. Item number two, direct the executive director to forward the budget to the city council for approval. And item two, K. Thank you very much, folks, and thanks to our finance staff and Director General. I always let you have 30 seconds to tell us who you want to recognize in this budget, who works so hard with you. So 30 seconds, yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it was a group effort, and uh, I'd like to thank the finance team because they helped to um, initiate our new CFO, Jeff Letourneau, through the process. So uh, he wants to thank them as well because it went very smoothly this year. Thanks very much, everybody. Okay. And now we did approve the budget, but if you find that number to Councillor Tony, I would like you to go share it with him, if you don't mind. Unless you want to announce it now, I know we approved it. Or you'll talk to the council. Good. Okay, thank you very much, folks. Uh, we have item number three, and uh, we have uh, a special guest came from uh, Toronto. Is the Madam Chief Commissioner, Ms. Renu Madani. She's the Ontario Human Rights Commission. And uh, I'll turn it to the chief to welcome our commissioner in our town. And uh, I'm not sure if you need time to set up or you're already set up, uh, Madam Commissioner. But uh, we'd like to welcome you in Ottawa. And uh, I, I hope you don't complain about our cold weather. So we haven't started yet. So good evening, thank you for having us. Um, I am I'm the Chief Commissioner of the Ontario Human Rights Commission and this is my colleague Runako Gregg who is a Senior Policy Analyst at the Commission and uh, we thank you for this opportunity to talk a bit about the Ottawa Police Services Traffic Stop Race-Based Data Collection Project. So, Commissioner, yeah. can you put the mic toward you? So yeah, sure. Please, a little closer to you. Thank you. Is this better? Oh, yeah, it's better. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, so this project, uh, so, so first of all, my deputation uh, was made on, uh, available online uh, earlier this afternoon, and the Ontario Human Rights Commission, uh, Renaco in particular, helped to uh, produce a report on, with our analysis of the findings uh, from the race-based data collection project, and that will be on our website tomorrow. So this project was based on a 2012 settlement between the Ottawa Police Services Board and the Ontario Human Rights Commission. After Chad Aiken, a young black man, filed a human rights complaint alleging racial profiling. As part of the settlement, the OPS agreed that its officers would collect race-based data on traffic stops for two years beginning in 2013. We're pleased that the OPS fully complied with the settlement and even went beyond what was required in its data collection efforts, resulting in one of the most comprehensive police data collection initiatives in Canadian history. But collecting data is just one part of the story, and in many ways it's secondary to the devastating personal experiences of people like Mr. Chad Aiken, whose rights are often ignored and who face great personal risk all because of the color of their skin or their perceived religion. Racial profiling can cause trauma and lasting damage. 
There is no pleasure in simple tasks like driving to the corner store or walking down the street when you know there's a good chance you'll be pulled over or stopped even if you've done nothing wrong. There's a pervasive fear and anxiety that takes hold when police look at you with suspicion, again, even though you know you've done nothing wrong. And you're hesitant to challenge the way you're being treated or even to come forward to report crime because police hold the power in your interaction. All too often when people like Mr. Aiken come forward to speak about racial discrimination, they're dismissed as being overly sensitive or not having sufficient proof that their experience is systemic. We are all familiar with the few bad apples defense. This quick dismissal or denial of the lived experience of racialized and indigenous people has resulted in a renewed focus on human rights data collection as the means to prove once and for all that racism is real. That is why it is disappointing to the Commission and to racialized communities when institutions continue to deny the existence of systemic racism in the face of clear quantitative data data that supports the qualitative experience of Mr. Aiken and many others like him. And that's why we're disappointed by recent comments that the OPS data does not prove racial profiling, especially when considered together with the personal ac accounts that led to the data being collected in the first place. The findings are alarming and entirely consistent with racial profiling and cannot and should not be easily explained away. The researchers found that black and Middle Eastern people experienced disproportionately high incidence of traffic stops, just as Mr. Aiken had when he filed his human rights application. Black drivers were stopped 2.3 times more than you would expect based on their driving population, and Middle Eastern drivers were stopped 3.3 times more often. In fact, even Middle Eastern women were stopped almost three times more than their representation in the driving population. This was the highest disproportion of any of the women included in the study. Young ma male black drivers aged 16 to 34 were stopped 8.3 times more than would be expected based on their driving population, and young male Middle Eastern drivers were stopped 12 times more often. Another concern is the result of the traffic stops of black, indigenous, Middle Eastern, and other racialized drivers. The researchers concluded, and I quote, that there was a greater propensity that these four racialized minor minority groups were traffic stopped for nothing serious enough to be warned or charged when compared with the white group, end quote. We see this as another indi indicator that systemic racial profiling was at play. The OPS and others have asserted that the researchers' find findings do not prove racial profiling. However, it's important to note that this research was not designed to prove causation, nor could any quantitative research on its own generally prove that systemic racism is the cause of disparities. But the significant degree of disproportions uncovered by the data, especially when combined with the accounts of Mr. Aiken and many other racialized people, cannot be explained away by non-discriminatory factors alone. The results from the OPS data collection project must be interpreted in the context of the historical relationship between police and racialized and indigenous communities and in Ottawa, but in Canada more generally. In many recent cases, courts and tribunals have found racial profiling to be behind seemingly neutral police interactions with racialized and indigenous peoples. They have accepted that racial profiling can rarely be identified through direct evidence and will more often be established through circumstantial evidence and inference. The high disproportionalities found in this report are just the kind of strong circumstantial evidence that decision makers are talking about when they look at racial profiling. In some cases, the racial disproportionality in traffic stops could be explained by individual officer bias, whether implicit or explicit. Implicit officer bias stems from unconscious stereotypes, whereas explicit bias arises from conscious stereotypes. 
Courts and tribunals have recognized that racial stereotyping will usually be the result of subtle, unconscious beliefs, biases, and prejudices. Less well understood is that racial profiling often arises from systemic or institutionalized discrimination. The result, these results in the data re report are more likely explained by systemic racial profiling. When the Commission talks about systemic racial profiling, we're talking about policies and practices and organizational culture that are part of the social or administrative structure of an organization. They may appear neutral, but may result in situations where racialized or indigenous people are singled out for greater, greater scrutiny. These policies or practices may be the product of unconscious racial biases. While these practices may not have been designed to specifically target particular racialized groups, the data shows that this was the outcome. And when you talk to racialized people, it's the outcome that matters. Examples where bias could be at play include routine or normal policing practices, such as officer deployment, intel intelligence gathering activities, and stopping people who are perceived to be out of place in a particular neighborhood. For example, suggestions that the deployment of more officers in, is needed in high crime areas, or that residents in priority neighborhoods want police to be active and visible, cannot justify stop practices that have a disparate impact on racialized people. In short, when communities ask police to be present in their neighborhoods, this cannot result in overbroad policing of an innocent people, and it cannot lead to fishing expeditions. In fact, a police deployment strategy that leads to greater traffic stops for racialized people in high crime areas is likely itself to be a form of systemic racial profiling. Greater numbers of traffic patrols in racialized neighborhoods means that racialized people are more likely to be targeted for minor offenses, such as traffic offenses, compared to, the, to white people in other neighborhoods who may be committing the very same offenses with the same regularity. These actions, especially when repeated regularly, can have a disturbing impact on the dignity of racialized people as we saw with Mr. Aiken's experience. We simply cannot contribute to, to some of the most marginalized people in our society living in fear and feeling hopeless. Our opinion about the data is based on our deep experience working on the issue of racial profiling and policing for more than a decade. Throughout this time, there have been many misunderstandings about what racial profiling actually means. When we talk about systemic racial profiling, police leaders sometimes think that we're calling individual police officers racist, and we're not. The commission defines racial profiling as any action undertaken for reasons of safety, security, or public protection that relies on stereotypes about race, color, ethnicity, ancestry, religion, or place of origin, rather than on reasonable suspicion to single out an individual for greater scrutiny or differential treatment. Racial profiling is a particularly damaging form of racial discrimination, and it undermines the relationship between police and racialized and indigenous individuals, families, and communities. Lack of trust in policing has negative impacts on the entire justice system, including risk of people not reporting cr crime and not cooperating with police. In short, racial profiling has a huge potential to undermine public safety. As part of our own strategic planning process, the Commission recently consulted nearly 300 individuals representing more than 80 community and advocacy groups across Ontario, including independent officers of the legislature and other duty holders. Throughout this process, we consistently heard concerns about systemic discrimination in policing, especially as it relates to African Canadians, Muslim and Arab Canadians, other racialized communities, indigenous peoples, and people with mental health disabilities. So we're making work related to removing systemic discrimination in the criminal justice system as one of our priorities. And we're not the only organization that's concerned with racial profiling in policing and in the criminal justice system more generally. 
I note that the African Canadian Legal Clinic is going to be before you as well this evening to talk about systemic racism and policing and the United Nations working group of experts on people of African descent who visited Ottawa last week sorry not last week last month found clear evidence that racial profiling is endemic in the strategies and practices used by law enforcement the working group urged the government to develop and implement an African Canadian justice strategy to address anti-black racism and discrimination within the criminal justice system. The Ontario government is also concerned about what's happening in our communities and has appointed Justice Tulloch of the Court of Appeal for Ontario to review the Office of the Independent Police Review Director, Special Investigations Unit and the Civil Ontario Civilian Police Commission. The government's appointment of Justice Tulloch was called in part in response to growing concerns about the increasingly strained relationship between police and community. Concerns that are being heard loud and clear in Ottawa in light of recent high profile incidents. Although other decision makers are at various stages in their work on systemic racial profiling, there's some work that the Ottawa Police Service needs to do now. The results of the data report highlight the need for all police services across Ontario, including the OPS, to put in place meaningful and effective measures to prevent and eliminate all forms of racial profiling. And the OPS needs to step up and acknowledge that something's wrong and commit to doing something about it. Positive change must come from the police themselves, from the chief and the board on down. Police chiefs and boards must first acknowledge systemic discrimination in policing, collect data to identify the many circumstances where racial profiling may occur, enact policies and procedures to eliminate discrimination, encourage independent monitoring and accountability, and discipline officers who engage in discrimination. And these are the steps I'm urging you to take today. I encourage you to reconceptualize your idea of community policing. Holding meetings is not enough. You also need ongoing, frequent, and meaningful dialogue between officers specifically attached to specific areas and the residents who live in them. Ideally, these officers would reflect those very communities they're meant to serve. This will require targeted recruitment of racialized and indigenous officers. In this way, crime prevention would be centered around partnerships with the community and shared goals. While community consultation is certainly important, it doesn't replace actively reassessing core policing activities that result in the kind of disproportions we see in the data report. So beyond the steps the OPS is proposing, it needs to dig deeper to examine itself and reassess its activities. For the required systemic change to happen, it is important that police services don't focus their efforts on denying racial profiling or managing community expectations. Instead, there must be a public commitment to changing practices, developing human rights organizational change plans, and then doing the hard work needed to make this happen. Police services can only succeed if they have the support and the trust of the communities they serve. The data collection project provides evidence of inequitable practices that are likely eroding that trust. As members of the Ottawa Police Services Board, you're in the position to put a vision in place for respecting human rights and to hold officers accountable when those aren't respected. At the board level, I call on you to mandate human rights-based data collection beyond the traffic stop context to measure and evaluate the extent to which the OPS is meeting its human rights obligations under the code. It is critical for the board to set up an independent monitoring committee to look at the OPS's compliance with its policy on racial profiling and evaluate the OPS's progress as is measured over time. Pursuing accountability is not about placing blame. Powerful institutions must accept responsibility when things don't go exactly as planned. This is the key way to rebuild trust and make our communities safer. I'm not asking for anything new here today. The OPS has a history as being a leader in collecting human rights-based data to build that accountability. For example, also on the agenda today, just after this discussion, is a discussion of data collecting, 
collected as part of a human rights settlement related to gender equity in the service. We are pleased to see that the OPS has conducted a gender audit which reaffirmed that it has work to do to improve women's equality in the OPS and identified areas of particular concern. Gender audits and similar initiatives allow organizations to determine if there are systemic barriers affecting code protected groups and to identify what they are. Perhaps what we are most pleased about is that the OPS has acknowledged that there are systemic issues to address in the area of gender equality. The OPS has met the requirements of the first deadline in our minutes of settlement and has made it cl a clear commitment to fulfill the remaining requirements. We call on the OPS to take the same steps in dealing with the tra traffic stop data report. We urge you to look beyond the numbers to the systemic issues that are clearly at play. And we urge you to acknowledge and be accountable for your policies, procedures and operations which are making it possible for racial profiling to happen. And we urge you to look at your organizational culture to make sure it is one of inclusion and not of inadvertent exclusion. The Commission is actively monitoring the steps that the Ottawa Police Service is taking to deal with the issue of racial profiling. And as always, we are happy to provide strategic advice to help you meet your legal obligations to provide non-discriminatory police services to the diverse community you serve. It's the least we can do for Chad Aiken and everyone else who has not enjoyed the same rights that all Ontarians are entitled to. Thank you. So we're, we are available to answer questions if there are any from uh, the board. For, uh, before I turn it to question, Madam Commissioner, uh, on behalf of the board, my colleagues here, I'd like to thank you for uh, flying to Ottawa tonight and be with us tonight. Just a few points, if I may. In, uh, so no one at the Ottawa Police or the Police Board is denying the life experience of people in, in our community, in this community. This board has not dismissed the complaint about police treatment. In fact, we committed significant public resources to measure how police treat residents of different racial groups. The study show that there was a problem and we have committed to working with our police service to fix it. We are in the process of creating our multi-year plan to address the result of the traffic stop race data collection project and we are relying on input from our stakeholders and community members as we move forward. It is most important to work to solve the problem, to make sure that people of all color and religious and are treated equally under the law. That is my focus as a chair of the Ottawa Police Service Board and I can assure you that's the commitment from our service as well. Uh, I will turn it out to my colleague for a question to the Commissioner. So uh, we we'll start with Member Smallwood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to say as a board member, um, we have all, I think, discussed and are, were really shocked by some of the uh, results that we saw. And I think there's a very, very strong commitment amongst all of us to make sure that this uh, is addressed and addressed in, a, in a quick, as quick a method as possible. Um, I, the, my question to you is just, is, is there anything that you think that uh, the chief or that the forces are, are not in agreement with you on? Is there any, do you see any disagreement? Because certainly what you said I'm in agreement with, so I'm wondering, do you see some disagreement somewhere? Well, I think that uh, this, obviously I really appreciate a very clear statement that the report is consistent with racial profiling. I don't know that that has been a entirely clear and consistent statement throughout this process um, and I think that is absolutely the first step uh, to addressing this issue because um, I think communities need to understand that their experiences are uh, real and that the board and the service are acknowledging them and uh, and as I said I don't think that that has been entirely clear um, throughout the, the since the report came out. Okay, uh, Member Nicholson, you have questions, sorry, because I was going to Councillor Hope. No, I don't really have a question. I just want to thank um, the Chief Commissioner for what I think is a really thorough and clear report. Um, you've articulated quite well uh, the issues that, that 
you know, that face minority communities in terms of dealing with the police. And you've given us a bit of a roadmap to follow. And thank you very much. We will be very eagerly pushing forward. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Member Nicholson. Member Hubley. Thank you uh, very much. And um, uh, I, too, uh, enjoyed reading the report and appreciate the, the effort that went into it. I just have a, a – and, and my apologies if this is uh, uh, because I'm a new member that I don't know the answer to these questions. But two of the things I wondered when I was reading that data was um, the uh, – where the stops are conducted, are they uh, – do we have the, the data to know that those are mainly high crime areas? Is that uh, – because um, for, for the officers to be doing the stop, I don't know – if that question's going to the chief or where, but my, uh, what I'm trying to get at is, do we know the area where the stops were conducted? Yeah, I will turn it to the chief for that. Mr. Chair, the uh, the study did not uh, take a uh, uh, a cut at the neighborhood level. Uh, the data is there, and that is something that we've uh, endeavored to do as as far as the next phase, working with the community, and then getting a better understanding of where exactly. Uh, uh, those stops are taking place uh, from a from a neighborhood perspective. So we would have the ability, but we don't have the information there now about the the population makeup of the neighborhoods where the stops were conducted. It's correct, Mr. Chair. The uh, the highest level uh, uh, of the data cut was at the district level. Uh, there was citywide uh, data, and then at the district level. Uh, but we uh, we don't have the uh, we haven't done the analysis at the neighborhood level. So. Uh, 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 indulge me just for one more question. When, when you say a district level, I'm thinking of an area like Hetherington uh, where Councillor Deans has uh, asked for a higher police presence or, um, you know, any of the, the, the communities within uh, our city. Uh, Councillor Tierney talked about uh, Jasmine Crescent. Um, with the issues that were going around there, and if he'll uh, forgive me for uh, using his area as an example, you, we asked for a higher police presence in there, which would mean more stops in that area. If the, the uh, uh, population makeup is higher in these, uh, the two groups that the report is speaking to, wouldn't it go to that you would have more st uh, stops of uh, blacks and uh, uh, Middle Eastern uh, Canadians? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I think... Um you know, the data, the study did not go down to that late neighborhood level. Uh, when I talk about the district, I talk about a, um, a, a, a broader level, like, like uh, I would say maybe uh, uh, East Ottawa or South Ottawa would be a district. Uh, it's, it's a very high level. We need to take a, a, a cut at it. Uh, and I can speak to the, uh, the you know, it, it leads to the issue of over-policing in our deployment model, which uh, goes, it speaks to uh, what the phenomenon that you're, you're addressing. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hoover. Uh, I think I have a question from my colleague, okay. Madame Valiquet. Hi there, and, and thank you for coming tonight. That was very good. You um, noted some of the things that you thought that we should be doing. One of them was uh, to establish a vision and an independent committee. Can you talk a little bit more about how you would see us going about doing that? Yeah, so to the extent that there is, uh, we've also recommended uh, sort of data collection on, outside of the traffic stop uh, scenario. So um, that may be something that the provincial government ends up mandating. But in any event, um, we believe that you need an independent committee to actually analyze that data on a kind of, you know, regular basis. So that might be an annual review. Um, so that you actually have some independent accountability for the analysis of the data. And, you know, I would say that one of the lessons we learned through this project, because this is one of the first data collection projects that the Commission has been involved in, is the importance of uh, making sure that that analysis uh, takes into account both qualitative and quantitative data um, so that that independent group would have access to both, uh, you know, the ability to obtain qualitative data along with quantitative data because certainly uh, I think a lot of the challenges uh, in terms of acknowledging whether or not this is in indicative of racial profiling uh, stems from the fact that this is an entirely quantitative uh, 
analysis. So hopefully that independent uh, group would be able to also uh, have connections to the community that, that they serve um, and that they represent so that they can bring some of that perspective into the analysis of the qu quantitative data. Mm -hmm. Do you have uh, anything to add to that? I believe, Chief, we'll turn it to you before uh... Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Commissioner. It's uh, good to see you again. Yeah, you too. Uh, we, uh, we have, the Auto Police Service has been working very closely with you for the past four years, and it's been a great partnership. And uh, I believe that the Auto Police Service has, has actually stepped up to the plate and done a lot of things, namely uh, uh, engaged in this first uh, study of its kind in Canada. And uh, I think that's important to, to, to recognize. Um, we, uh, we are doing a number of things uh, with the, the police service. And I want to make it clear that I've never denied the, existing, the existence of racial, racial profiling. I said it before that racial profiling exists in society, can exist in policing. And uh, it has no place in either. And we've also acknowledged the fact that we respect and understand the lived experiences of people, including that of Chad Akins. And I think that is why uh, we have done the right thing and we have engaged in this study. Uh, we have continued to collect the data way pa uh, past its uh, are required and we will continue to collect this data because it is the right thing to do and uh, for the police service and for our, our community. And um, I think that's, you won't find any other police service in Canada that has done this and uh, I think we're, we're paving the way uh, to doing some uh, amazing work. Um, we are concerned with the data, uh, and that's why we are taking a number of steps to better understand it uh, so that we can respond alongside with our, with our community. And uh, we are concerned, as I said, with the number of Middle Eastern individuals and blacks that are being stopped in our communities. And, uh, we talked about potentially, you know, our, the over-policing and the, the deployment model that we're actually using. And uh, you're quite right in deploying uh, officers uh, in an area uh, that is plagued with uh, potentially drug violence or gang activity. Uh, we're being called upon to respond to those communities. But what we're telling our officers is go in there and do traffic stops. We're not going in there to deal with the specific issues that the community is asking us to do. The community wants us to find the individuals that are responsible for the gang violence and the drug trafficking. However, we're directing our officers to do there and, and, and casca casting a, a large net and catching a number of individuals who are legitimately committing traffic offenses. But that's not the reason that we should be in there. We should be in there to d deal with the, the root cause issues that are having our communities. Uh, so we, uh, I think that's the discussion that we are going to have, the meaningful discussion with our community to better understand uh, how can we better respond proactively but also reactively to the concerns that are being addressed in the communities. Uh, we have uh, conducted over a number of years many consultations and we will continue to move forward and you, you characterize those as just meetings. Um, I don't know if you've been to those meetings. They're not just meetings. They're, um, they're uh, active discussions and really rich dialogue that is taking place between the police service and the community. And uh, the community actually has stepped up as well and has shaped this study and will continue to shape uh, the recommendations and the way forward. Uh, uh, with the police service. They are part of the solutions uh, that we're looking for. We've for. We're forming a community advisory group that will help us shape those solutions moving forward. Uh, I think it's important that uh, you know, we expect feedback and criticism from the broad community. We, we, we acknowledge that. Uh, but uh, you know, we are continuing to commit uh, to working forward together on this issue and uh, working through the, the recommendations in the report with our community. Uh, it's, uh, as I mentioned before, I think uh, there's no other police service in, in Canada that has taken on this type of work, and I'm very proud of the work that we have all done. Uh, and part of that work was engaging our members, and um, the members, I think, are professional, they're dedicated to our community, uh, and they've done a tremendous job in collecting this data, and they continue to collect this data. And they're the ones that are out there building relationships of trust 
with the community. They're working with our, our outreach liaison team. They're all taking fair and impartial policing training. They've participated actively in the Raise Data Collection Project. We're out there trying to recruit members from the diverse community. All that work is done by our members because because they care deeply about the uh, the police service. They, they care deeply about our community. And I think that they've, sh they've shown through their work, through this entire project, that they are professional women and men uh, that um, that understand the importance of trust and confidence in our police uh, in our community and I support them uh, each and every day and uh, you know as the chief for, for our police service and uh, we are committed to continuing working with our community through these difficult issues they have been very difficult discussions going back five ten years ago having these types of discussions in the community uh, they wouldn't be as as uh, as civilized as they are now, they're actually very engaging, and we're having. You know, last week we had another one when they uh, they they we talked about the report, and they're they're very real and important issues from our community that they're raising. We're but we're having that we are having that discussion, and I know that we will uh, move forward and find those solutions that are that are best for our, uh, for our police service for the community, and that'll keep Ottawa uh, safe. Thank you. Could I just respond to that? Sorry, yes, I just Chief, of course. We're... Two minutes. All right. um, I just wanted to say uh, I, I had the pleasure of attending one of your community events uh, probably within a month of being appointed, and I was very impressed with the event, and it certainly had a different tone than the meetings in Toronto. So uh, I appreciate that you have done a lot of work with community to build that trust and that goodwill, and I wouldn't ever suggest that meeting with community is not important. It certainly is. I think that all I was trying to suggest was that that kind of analysis that you talked about, about deployment patterns and what are officers being asked to do when they're deployed to these neighborhoods, that is, this data raises those kinds of issues more than it raises um, some of the other issues that may require uh, more understanding from the community. And that's all that uh, I was trying to suggest was that this, the, the, so much of the analysis will require inward thinking about where exactly is this disproportionality coming from because as you have pointed out uh, before, if 89% of officers could not un see the identity of the driver, then it speaks less to uh, officer bias and it speaks more to systemic uh, practices that are resulting in disparity and that's why we think it's so important that it be an in, there be some internal focus of where that is where is it happening at what at what place in the institution thank you Thanks. thank you thank you very much chief commissioners we do have uh, uh, member uh, or director of the legal service African Canadian legal clinic would like to speak to us Mr. Uh, Denardo Jones and I will invite Mr. Jones to take a seat and address the board uh, we do have your uh, presentation in front of us sir but uh, you have five minutes to address the board if you can take the any mic doesn't matter but go ahead thank you turn off the mic <coughs> So, um, as mentioned, my name is Donato Jones, and I'm the director of um, legal services for the African Canadian Legal Clinic. Um, <clears throat> the commissioner has, I think, uh, aptly canvassed a lot of the issues that um, my organization um, finds concerning with the report. Uh, so, I won't overlap uh, what the commissioner has talked about, but in particular, I want to talk about the uh, report and the fact that it seems to be I would say the researchers were reluctant to conclude that the OPS is engaged in anti-black racial profiling and um, the ACLC would submit that the data um, it's borne out in the data their own data that there is this uh, disproportionality and you know, it seems as if there's a reluctance to call it for what it is, right? I mean, if you look back to every study that's been done on issues with police relations with the black community, there's always disproportionality, there's always overrepresentation, and it's always been called what it is, racial profiling. And I think there was ample information in the data to conclude that. 
And I think when that is done, we can have a more meaningful conversation about what to do about it. But to skirt the issue and say, well, you know what, it could be this, but we're not at the point where we're willing to conclude that it is racial profiling. I think um, that's shirking the responsibility. I think if we call it for what it is, we can start having some meaningful dialogue as to what to do about it. Now, another thing that I found interesting was the fact that the benchmark used by the researchers was the commute to work um, demographic. Well, I think it's a sociological fact that a lot of folks of African descent are underrepresented in the labor force. There's a lot of sociological force, um, you know, that leads to that, that I'm not going to discuss here, but I think we can all agree that that particular demographic, I think, misses the mark. Now, a lot of our folks are not commuting to work between 8 and 5, so I'm not sure why that benchmark was used. However, even with that benchmark, that deficient de benchmark, there was still evidence of disproportionality. So I wonder if we used a more representative benchmark, what it would reveal. For example, pedestrian stops, which a lot of these communities that are complaining about anti-black uh, racial profiling, it's about the police, to use a vernacular, running up on them and jacking them up. That's what we're hearing from our community, right? So pedestrian stops is important. That's something that needs to be looked at seriously. What's happening in these neighborhoods with people who are on foot? What folks fail to understand is we're using this idea of DWB, driving while black, great. But black folks are subject to racial profiling no matter their position in space. They could be standing, walking, eating a sandwich. It doesn't matter. That's the issue here. So we need to broaden our benchmark or broaden our demographic to involve you know, folks who are not just driving to work. As I said, we're underrepresented in that area, but we are overrepresented in other areas that, I mean, let's say these unenviable areas, you know, um, collecting public, um, public assistance, for example, um, you know, living in some of the most dilapidated conditions and so on. We're overrepresented in those areas. So if we're gonna do a comprehensive study Okay, to find out how the police can better um, interact with African Canadians, we need to keep in mind that the folks who are facing this evil are not the ones driving to work, or exclusively the ones driving to work. So we need to figure out what is a better benchmark. Now, I would argue that the researchers chose to rely on police officers to collect data about you know, their perception of a particular traffic stop. You gotta understand, racial profiling, it's, a, it's an experiential um, thing. You know, it, it should be based on the perceptions and observations of the people who are experiencing it. You know, um, to use the old adage, he who feels it knows it, and you need to find out from those folks what's going on. And I guarantee you, if the study focused on the people who are feeling it, I can guarantee you that the result would be a resounding, resounding yes, there's racial profiling at the hands that, you know, at the hands of the, uh, the OPS. But we're asking police officers to figure out whether or not they stop this person because this person is black. I mean, I, I don't understand that methodology. I think we need to, you know, there needs to be a methodological shift. I understand that, you know, for, um, you know, for statistic reasons, it's probably a lot easier to use, you know, that particular benchmark. I know I read in the report that the researchers chose that benchmark because of utility. It was easier for them to use. I say go into the communities and speak to these people. Go into Codwell, go into Lethbridge, go into Lower Town, go into Ritchie, go into Ramsey, and speak to these young men and speak to these, um, their parents, and ask them, what are their interactions like with the police? 
you know, why were you stopped, for example? And I guarantee you they'll tell you it was probably for nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jones. Uh, before I turn it to the chief, any question to the delegate? No. Chief. Uh. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, it's unfortunate that uh, four years ago when we reached out to the ACLC and, and numerous times since that, that you didn't take us up on the offer to participate in either the community consultations or the actual shaping of the report, the, uh, the methodology, uh, the benchmarking uh, as to how we would do this, this, this report. Uh, but I'm glad to see that you came down from Toronto today to speak to us. Um, I think it's also important to remind you know, the, that the, the Chad Aikens uh, was a traffic stop. Uh, it was not a, uh, he was not uh, walking uh, on the street. So that is why this study focused on vehicular stops. But I sh I'm sure you appreciate that, you know, the province has uh, come down with some regulations uh, to deal with uh, regulated interactions around uh, what we used to call street checks. Uh, so we are certainly uh, will conform with that legislation to, uh, to include all the, the rich data that, that, that is needed. Um, so uh, appreciate your, your thoughts and your comments, and uh, uh, there's always an opportunity to, uh, to engage as we move forward. I know that uh, we invited you last week, but there was no representatives there, but we're always looking for, for your input and insight. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, and thank you, Mr. Jones, for your presentation. We're going to keep your presentation, and as we said it earlier, or I said it earlier, we are committed working together with the Commissioner and our service, and we'll continue to do so. But thank you for your feedback, Mr. Jones. Thank you. Item number three, folks, is the, the Human Rights and Racial Profiling Policy Annual Report. Uh, can we receive item number three with the receive? Thank you very much. Uh, item number four is the OPS Gender e uh, Equality Audit Report. And uh, when the staff are setting up, I think I'm going to leave it in the hand of the Deputy Chief, uh, De Deputy Chair. i got to go. Okay. Mr. Chair, um, our service has been conducting a gender audit as part of the settlement with the Ontario uh, Human Rights Commission. It began with a complaint from a sworn officer of our police service. Uh, this presentation was heard by the HR committee uh, two weeks ago, uh, but we have uh, prepared another presentation for the benefit of all board members. And um, one of our, our goals is to cultivate and maintain an environment of equality for all our members. And although recruitment is strong, uh, currently just over 23% of our sworn members are, being, uh, are, are women. But I acknowledge that recruitment uh, isn't uh, enough. While we've been putting in place uh, policies and processes that support equality, the audit shows us that we clearly have some significant work to do. It's clear by the audit that more work needs to be done to ensure that our female sworn members are supported, have equal opportunities, and excel to achieve their career goals. So I'd like to turn it over to, uh, to the Director General who will introduce our panel members and uh, Dr. Karita Fiedel Van Dyke. Thank you, Chief. <coughs> Sorry, thank you, Chief. Um, I'm joined here today with our team. Uh, this is the sort of the front office team that worked on the on the report. Uh, Superintendent Steve Bell, who's our CHRO, Michelle Rathwell, who's our Director of HR, and Dr. Karina Fielde Van Dyke, who is the the expert we brought on board to help us. Uh, we also had another expert involved, Dr. Ruth, or sorry, Ruth Montgomery, who has uh, done some of the first uh, women in policing uh, uh, work on gender and she helped us in the background. So thank you everybody for um, um, the paying attention to the next uh, 15 minutes or so while we walk you through uh, the gender audit. We're very pleased to be here and to be presenting the, the results of the first gender audit. And I say that because um, I can see from the work that we've done how game-changing this is. There's, there's very little work that's been done in Canada on gender in policing. And I think we, we're probably amongst the first, if not the first, to have carried out a study in such a quantity 
qualitative way and to be clear about um, the results and the work we have to do to um, achieve the goals we want to achieve, which is to ensure that, uh, that, that um, all genders uh, can work in a gender equitable environment. And you'll hear us talk about gender as if it's uh, male and female, but we know, all of us know that there are more than two genders. We're, um, that's an area that's, that's growing actually and uh, has, there's a lot to be learned in it, but you'll see that for the purposes of this report that we, we pretty much focus on male, female gender. Um, the gender audit started as a result of the resolution of a complaint to the Human Rights Commission. Um, and the, the complaints uh, centered on both family status, which is very important in our environment with more uh, married uh, men and women, uh, with children working in as police officers, and gender issues. So as we present uh, our work tonight, you'll start to get a view both from both gender perspectives of what uh, some of the the um, uh, what it's the environment that our police officers work in and some of the um, barriers that they face uh, on a gender basis. Um, there are four phases to the work and the, the, two fa the first two phases are what we're bringing you today. The, um, you'll see that um, uh, we uh, the, the comprehensive look that we'll give you is actually going to come about from a couple of things. I'll get you guys to go to the next slide. Um, we've done a comprehensive look at um, uh, the 2012 census, and once again, Ottawa Police is a bit of a um, um, pioneer in that area. That's our second census, and we're conducting a third one next year. So you'll see from sen our census data, which means it's you know uh, very... Um, at an 85% response rate, a very reliable picture of what's going on. And we've had, that will give you a feel for what our environment has looked like. And the gender um, equity study itself will start to go below that data to uh, describe the perspective that, uh, that we have or we've discovered about both male and f the female members and what they face in our police service. Um, we've done this work by involving experts and that's really important to say because we're not experts in this area, but we've brought together people who are. Dr. Karina uh, Fieldy Van Dyke and Ruth Montgomery have helped us. As we've done the work, we've gone out to, to um, talk to other experts so that we are learning as we're going because this is an area that, we, that each of us can, can learn and share with. The context for this work, uh, we, it came to us through a, a complaint. Um, it's not new to policing. Policing is a male-dominated profession. And uh, we see that often um, issues arise. The, the, it's not surprising for us to be tabling this when several months ago there was a historic apology from the RCMP commissioner about um, gender issues more in the area of sexual harassment and bullying. That's not the topic we're talking about tonight. But uh, you'll see also that uh, Calgary tabled a 2013 review. And what we found is that these groups are reaching out to us now and we're reaching back so that we can learn from each other's experience and uh, sort a way forward. Um, Gender issues haven't always been dealt with uh, in a systematic way. That's either by looking at them and studying them or in order to correct them and move on in a sustainable way. We've kind of relied on a strategy of just increasing the number of women, increasing recruitment in the hopes that that would change how uh, the experience that women have in policing. That's proven not to be effective. And I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Karina now so that she can describe to you our environment at Ottawa Police and some of the things that we've learned that we need to correct to become more effective. Thank you. Thank you and also thank you for the uh, opportunity to present to you today. Um, we are very short on, on the time that we have to present, so I'll jump right in with the results. So on the slide there, um, you will see that we looked at a number of demographic variables as they came out of the census 2012. For today, we will focus only on the ones on the left-hand side, so really not just a bird's eye view, but really from, from an eagle perspective. Um, so there's way more than 
what we will be presenting today, and I encourage you to also have a look at the two reports that you received that's on your table based on phase one for the census uh, 2012 results, and then also phase two, which details the, the gender audit. So before we look at those uh, five variables that we've uh, selected to present to you today based on significant differences, we need to also have a bit of a context. So um, Chief Bordelow already alluded to the numbers on the sworn side where we have 23.4% uh, uh, female sworn members as opposed to 76.6% for male sworn members. And we see that that it's really a flipped ratio on the civilian side. So the sworn side really uh, presents itself with a pressing point if we do consider that to be a, a male-dominated organization, you need to have fewer than 25% or a quarter of your workforce need to be represented by fewer than, to, um, uh, uh, than 25% of a, a specific demographic. So the the first order of the day then is to ensure that we try and achieve at least the 25%. So that would be a first objective. Um, and that poses an interesting benchmark for us today. So you will see the 23% provides a perforated line in red, which is really the average um, male um, represent, uh, sorry, female representation. And the blue perforated line is then the male perforation. So for the purposes of analyzing the census results, those two lines are really our benchmarks. So that is not suggesting that they are equal, but at least it gives us a starting point to see where are critical issues that we need to perhaps address first or most um, uh, essentially before we look at other ratios as well. Um, so looking then at directorates, those are uh, all the directorates that, that were included in 2012 census. And just to summarize, so if we look on the blue side, um, or to the blue bars at the, on the male side, the top two that, that um, came out there as where males dominate as opposed to females would be in emergency operations and also for the office of the chief. Um, if we look at the female, on the female side, so those would be the red bars, and where the females dominate, those would be in executive services and resourcing and development. So we could use the perforated lines as our benchmark, so we could look at where do males fall short in what areas um, in order to achieve, so what, what lies significantly below the blue perforated line. And we can also do the same on the female side, which bars fall way below or significantly below the red perforated line. And then those would be areas where we would focus first. That's not to say that the other areas are not important, but it does give us a, a starting point, especially if we want to formulate short-term versus medium and long-term goals. Um, in terms of partnership, so around 85% uh, of all sworn members are in some type of relationship, either by marriage or um, in, in another form of agreement. So it really speaks to the majority of sworn members. So if we look at males alone, 15.8% of sworn males who are in a relationship has it with another OPS member. When we look at the female side, that number climbs to 42.3%, so quite a difference there. Uh, part of that, of course, is because we have um, the unequal number. So for every male member to be in a relationship that is with a female officer, that will then be drawn from a smaller pool, and that increases that sample, that uh, percentage. Um, in, in terms of rank, 
When we look at the different ranks, we can see that um, for constables, it, it's fairly representative based on our current um, ratios of males and females. But then when we look at the staff sergeant levels or the NCO levels, as they are also called, then we see that the females start lagging behind. So that's the first point, is to see that as we climb the ranks, that females start lagging behind. The the second point is to also notice that on the acting side of NCOs, we still have good female representation based on their current numbers. But then when it be, um, gets to the actual uh, positions, that's where the females um, fall behind as well. So that is another way in which to look at those results. In terms of child and dependent care, um, out of all the sworn members, male or female, around 69% uh, are involved in child care and about 61.5% in dependent care. Um, where the differences come in is who is actually taking care of their children or dependents living with them at home when uh, a high number of hours per week are required while they are in the job. And the bars there show clearly that when that is the case, then the females are the stand-in for that role. So that needs to be factored in, um, in uh, regular op op operations in policing as well. In terms of education, uh, overall when we look at the two pie charts, so on the left hand side you see the males, on the right hand side you see the females. They look fairly similar but with a little bit closer inspection um, one will see that on the male side where males dominate as opposed to females is really in the highest educational levels of secondary school, college and trades. Whereas for females, they tend to dominate comparative to males in um, having university degrees, uh, either incomplete degrees or already completed. And they also mentioned, compared to males, that they had more skills and certifications. So there's a dissonance in terms of educational levels as well. So at this point, I'm um, just uh, handing it back to Director General Fraser for one slide. So um, the, back, the census gives you a backdrop for the, the, uh, our, our population of men and women and how they differ. What happened now in part two of our work is to have a look at um, can, the gender audits itself and see what it tells us about the gender equality issues and environment at OPS. So we made a decision at the outset of the work that we would focus on sworn members. Um, that was quite logical given that the complaint itself came forward uh, from uh, one of our sworn female members. And so the doesn't mean that we will abandon our commitment to the civilian members. We won't. Uh, in the future, we'll have a look at civilian gender equality issues as well because, as you can see, um, it's a different issue. It's a female-dominant environment on the civilian side, so it will be quite interesting to see uh, the issues that crop up there. Um, I mentioned already that we've uh, engaged two experts to help us with, uh, Dr. Friedel Dave Van Dyke and Ruth Montgomery, and that's been a very helpful for us to see the organization from an outsider's eyes and to help identify um, what's systemic and what's um, also at a statistically significant level because you'll see that this work has been carried out in a very quantitative way for one part and then the second part was very much driven by qualitative remarks and interviews. The phase one results um, from the census uh, data really gave us a good baseline against which we could then conduct um, a gender audit. So we used a particular methodology called the Equality Framework, which was developed by my organization. 
Um, and this uh, framework aligned well with international literature on gender audits, it, uh, made use of key gender equality concepts, and it was directly applicable to the OPS. So it consists of four what we call C elements that really covers the scope of gender equ uh, equality, broadly speaking, and then also specifically to, to gender. Um, and these uh, four elements are called strategic command, practical capacity, liable compliance, and work culture. So each of these uh, elements consists of five, five statements to make up a total of 20 statements. And those statements were then also used as criteria which could be used as, uh, on a rating scale to either evaluate uh, written documentation or else use it in um, more unstructured data as well. So under the gender equality framework using a rating scale, an organization is set to, to have achieved gender equality compliance if they um, achieved a score of 61% um, and or above. So overall, the OPS scores fell below the standard. And that was when we looked at document pages, also called written data sources, where we achieved 28.2% or when we looked at unwritten data uh, sources, so those would be response sheets completed by a select group of OPS members alongside uh, interviews that were conducted with them. So overall, um, from that side, the OPS achieved a score of 32.4%. So when we look um, one level further, um, in other words, at the, the level of the elements, so you will see there um, in, uh, in uh, yellow, those would be the written documents that we uh, looked at, so just over 2,000 pages of documents. And uh, if that we compare that with what we heard from the members, the results are very comparable. In other words, the one part, the more quantitative or structured part really very, is verified by the qualitative part as well. Uh, back to the previous guest speaker who emphasized that both the quantitative and the qualitative are important. Secondly, when we look at uh, all these percentages per element, it is clear that work is really needed everywhere. So no particular percentage stands out as particularly low or particularly high comparative to the others. But we do see that the two middle elements of practical capacity, that's the PC and the LC, liable compliance is probably the lowest out of the four elements, so that would also be a good place uh, to start in the next six months and beyond. Um, last but not least, uh, we also did qualitative data analysis on the interviews. So we had interviews with um, 20 members of the OPS, some of them who came forward, some of them who were selected at random, both male and female, um, and then also representing all ranks within this, um, the OPS uh, sworn police force. And uh, interviews were conducted for about an hour to an hour and a half with them. Those were recorded and then transcribed um, and then analyzed to pre present um, you with aggregated results because uh, anonymity was promised and those interviews were conducted in, in um, in confidence. So out of that, we had emerging themes, 21 of them, which were then labeled into f seven broader categories and then labeled again at a higher level into two categories. And that tree structure is provided, I, I think, on page 59 or 58 of the phase two report if you wanted to see an overview. So for today, I'm just going to list um, the middle structure, the seven themes, and just give you one or two examples for each. So the first one had to do with comprehension of gender equality. So aspects that members would have um, mentioned there is, is giving acknowledgement that 
uh, OPS membership is male dominated on the sworn side, um, that they also are aware that the community actually has an even gender distribution, so there's a bit of a disconnect there, although we are not after achieving exact percentages in the com community either. And then also that OPS members expressed a need for gender fairness and justice, that they wanted that and that they are ready for that. Uh, secondly, um, the, or the second theme would be favoritism or preferential treatment. And here members really experienced unfairness in accommodations, which are termed as accommodations by choice, specifically around maternity and parental leave, uh, opportunities in sought after sections or units and courses uh, where they felt that there was um, uh, notable unfairness and then also the whole issue of how job placement is is conducted in the senior ranks not by a fair process but through hand picking um, the third theme or theme C was about uh, promote the impact of promotional processes and here they felt that that process was largely fair, albeit members feel the promotional panel is not 100% unbiased, being um, uh, mostly male-dominated, uh, sometimes known uh, by the candidates, etc., cetera, um, only drawn from internal membership, etc. And then that the emphasis on recent experience only um, they felt was limiting as well because members have more to offer than just recent experience. Uh, the fourth theme, theme D, is about female assistance or giving them a leg up. Um, and that is where members notice that the OPS has recently begun to pay more attention to gender equity. Um, in other words, a focus on female numbers per se. Um, some male and female members understand why this is necessary, others don't. Um, and they also feel that more member education and communication are needed in this regard because not everybody is on board with that, that um, notion. The fifth one is about problem perpetuation, and that is that until now members feel the OPS has tolerated a work tradition of gender inequality that is against human rights. And this toleration is both uh, consciously done and also subconsciously. So some members are unaware that they're doing that because it's part of the culture. Um, and then others are aware of doing that but feel safe in doing so because they protect each other. Then gender inequality intersects with other member diversity characteristics as well, so the complexity of it should not be underestimated. Uh, we've heard a lot about um, racial inequality today as well, so that's just one example of that complexity. Uh, the sixth theme has to do with the need for consequences. So OPS members see a lot of talk but no action or a lot of promises, uh, but they don't really see any results of that, and they really feel that the next six months will be critical for that. So they are dis dissatisfied with the weak support in the OPS and with uh, inadequacy in re repercussions from OPS leadership when gender e inequality occurs, and the, also that the support is aimed at protecting the status quo. Some members feel apprehensive about OPS readiness to address gender equality effectively, and that's why their eyes are also very much on what will come out of this uh, gender audit. Then the last theme is about um, not on the negative side but on the positive side and that is that members also acknowledge that they, had, that they want and wanted to keep the OPS gender equality in perspective. So members mentioned that they were encouraged by the new generation of recruits beginning to enter the workforce amongst other positives as well. So that also helps to balance things out. So that's the, the results in a nutshell, and I would like to just hand over for the last uh, slide to uh, Superintendent Bell.
Thank you, Karina. Uh, this audit's provided us a qualitative and quantitative information which we're going to move forward from. As part of phase three and, for, and phase four, we're required to develop new and or amend our policies around job placements and promotion, as well as draft a new human rights accommodation policy. The work will need to be completed by May of 2017 and fully implemented by November of 2017. As the Human Rights Chief Commissioner has pointed out today, we take responsibility for these results. We know we're a better police service when we have both men and women working together to provide services to our community. The idea is very clear. Women and men need to share the responsibilities in all areas of our service. Women need to be provided with the opportunities and access to systems in the OPS that are equitable. We know that we have work to do in this area and are committed to achieve that equality for all of our members. We look forward to bringing forward the continued progress to the HR subcommittee and the overall board as a whole as we move ahead. With that, we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, folks, uh, to all of you. For, uh, and uh, I think uh, some of us at the HR committee, we had the pleasure of receiving this and be able to have the longer version and have discussion about it than tonight. I know you, you were running uh, through it. Any question from my board colleague about this? Uh, Member Smallwood? Yes. Yes, I do, Chair. Um, uh, two questions. The first was on slide, I think it was slide five. Um, you talk about the, how the, the uh, inequity is in, in different departments. And I, I just wondered, you, um, I, I didn't see any weight, weighing in terms of weighting in terms of the numbers of people involved. And it just struck me that, it's, for instance, uh, in one of them, um, a very small number of people could have a massive impact, I would think, on, the, on those ratios. I, one I noticed was, I think, um, the office of the chief. I wouldn't have thought there would be that many people in that office, and therefore a very small shift might give us the impression we've done a wonderful job, but it may only be a very small number of people. Is that the case? And was there no, there is no, no waiting, I think, on it? Yeah. There. So, as I say, I, I use the example of the office of the chief. It just, you show that as being, we've got to put a priority on it, but the, I would have thought there wouldn't be that many people in that office anyway. Yeah. So it's very, very true that in larger departments that um, the, the chance to, to um, or chance plays less of a role than in smaller departments. However, the weighing lies in the perforated lines. So it is important to compare it back to, to the actual lines and then also in the report itself where we have the detailed statistics. In each of the cells of those, those directorates, we would see if that particular cell is st statistically significant different as well. Mm -hmm. So in looking further, we will be able to tell, you know, is it, is it significant um, in the context of the numbers, whether they are high or low. Okay. Uh, the other question I had was, uh, in the report that was given to us, there's a comment, uh, a positive comment, says we have seen some success with our last eight recruitment classes, including 27 women out of a total of 106 new recruits, which sounds like positive news. And I guess my question for you is, um, given that we're, we've only got 23%, so math isn't my strong point, but that would seem like maybe somewhere around 27%. But you had mentioned about the problem we have with retention, and so I'm wondering if really this isn't great news at all, because if we're only getting, 20, say, 27% uh, and we have a high loss rate, then maybe we're no better off than we were before, so maybe this isn't great news. And that's really the classical issue with using percentages. So usually um, the statistical guideline is that if you look at size, sample sizes of more than 100, then a percentage would be a, a good representation. If we look at smaller categories with fewer people in it, then we should really use the actual numbers. So again, based on what, depending on what you are referring to, sometimes it's good to look at the actual number count as well and not just the percentage. Mr. Chair, the other exercise that, we'll, that you'll see us doing is analyzing our um, age groups 
by gender uh, so that we can, we can start to forecast the number of women who we will uh, leave the police service through retirement because we know that our first job is to replace those women because that's how we will just maintain a steady state. And if we need to increase our proportion of women, we have to go beyond just replacement and add to that number. So there's a great forecasting exercise we can do to, to uh, build, identify the number of women we need to recruit in order to get to, say, the 25% number, which starts to, to um, create an environment where we're not deemed male dominant. And you'll see us do that work over the next six months. So, uh, just to clarify for me, it says we have seen some success. Is this really success or we don't know whether it's success or it may be when you do the thing that we're, we're actually going in the wrong direction? I just, I'm trying to understand the report we were given that says we have seen some success recently. I think the number we're quoting in that report is relative to our efforts in the past. That ratio demonstrates a higher proportion of recruiting in the current period than we've had in the past. To answer the question of our, where are we with respect to replacing the women who are about to retire, we don't have the answer for you on that yet. Member Mickelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, I've I may have missed it, but um, Superintendent, you said we have to complete something by November 2017. What exactly, and is it really doable? So we have uh, two more phases to complete. The first will be a complete review of our policies, specifically around job placements uh, and promotional policy to make sure that there's no inequalities in those, in those processes. The other one will be to draft a human rights accommodation policy. So that policy will go beyond uh, just job placements and transfers to make sure that there's no uh, room for inequal inequalities in any of our HR or other processes. Those need to be dra uh, drafted and reviewed by May um, of 2017 and a full implementation of any changes around those, including tra training, any infrastructure changes that we need, any process changes that we need by November of 2017. The Chief wants to give us an extension. I know she's in the audience still, but... Member <laughs> uh, Tierney, Councillor Tierney. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a quick question. Um, my daughter actually has a friend, and, and she's, uh, she went through, you know, Algonquin and the Police Foundation stuff, and she's been really, you know, lured in by the RCMP to go and apply with their group. Do we, and forgive me if it was in the presentation, uh, we've had two great presentations this evening that were quite, uh, quite thick packages. Uh, do we have any stats about RCMP hiring on the, on the female front versus city policing? Because uh, I just want to know maybe it's a marketing issue. I'm, I'm just trying to get to if we have those kind of numbers between that force and our force. So I can, I can speak to that. Um, we don't have direct stats on the recruiting efforts of the RCMP, the OPP, or any other police service that's actively recruiting. What we do have is we do have uh, a renewed effort internally to make sure that we're identifying good candidates and bringing them in, in through our doors to, uh, to apply to the auto police service because we are a great police service to work for. So um, we have, we, and I think this is what the Director General is speaking of, we have in increased our efforts around recruiting women, racialized members into our police service. And I think as we move ahead, you'll be able to see the, those efforts uh, rewarded. Great. And just as a quick follow-up, so we're going in, like I, I think it was the RCMP that went into Algonquin and we're actively recruiting. I assume we're doing the same as well. We absolutely are, and actually we're undertaking a complete review of our outreach recruitment right now to make sure that our processes are as quick and streamlined as they can be, and that we're reaching out to all of those candidates to bring them through our doors so they aren't going to the RCMP, they aren't going to other policing services. Yeah, we have a lot of competition, unfortunately, so thank you. Thank you, Member, Member Hubley, you have a question? No, we're good. So on our report, folks, and staff will be coming back to us in May 2017, Director General, you said? So, uh, on a report, it's received. Received, thank you very much. And uh, that will uh, conclude our uh, public uh, meeting, portion of the meeting. So, we need a motion to move in camera that the Ottawa Police Service Board adjourn the public portion of his meeting to move in camera to discuss confidential items pertaining to legal and
So moved. Okay, we're adjourned.